Pete George, and we are live on Game Changers with Vicki Abelson. Our guest tonight is Jay Kogan. All right. Okay, so Jay, you're a really good sport. I got Jay here really early, drove a really long way to get here, and we sitting, we're sitting, just sitting around. But Jay, you know, like I, I, as I was telling you, I usually know my guests. I don't know you. I feel like I, like I know you a little bit better now, but there's a lot I don't know that I want to know. Like I just found out you have an in, a, a current improv troupe. So, so t let's talk current events. So is that something you've been doing straight through your career? Okay, and he's, he's eating a chip. We encourage eating on this show. Is that what? Almost done. Okay. Oh. Okay, good. <laughs> yes, I, uh, I've, been, I've been doing improv for uh, many, many years, since I was like uh, 16 years old. Okay, so what, what started that quest? I mean, I know about your dad. Let's talk about your dad for a minute. Okay, let's Tell talk us. about my dad. Let's talk let's about talk my fucking dad. Right. What do you want to know about my dad? My fucking mother. Jesus Christ. So, well, because your dad wrote for Mad Magazine. I mean, that's like... I, that's it's cool. dead. It died. It did. No, yeah, made that rap for Mad Magazine, which, which got me a lot of juice when I was like seven. I bet it did. People in first grade really thought, oh, Mad Magazine, do you have access to those books? I said, absolutely. <laughs> they have the Snappy Answers books. It's like, ooh, that's very cool. <laughs> yeah, my dad was very cool. And, seven, and when I was seven years old, my dad was super cool. Did you think he was cool? I've always thought he was cool. But yeah, but, but other That's people... That's really good, because yeah. a lot of kids don't think that about No, no, he's very cool. I mean, you know, <laughs> the usual son-dad issues in general, but he's a cool guy. Yeah, was he funny know. at home? Yeah, but I mean, you know, people aren't funny at home. People who are funny at home, are, are funny in life, are, are the people at home are terrible audience, because we know the jokes that are coming. <laughs> we know exactly the jokes. When my father starts a joke, the rest of the family could finish the joke because we know the rhythm, we know what's happening. We've heard all the stuff before. I so see. he didn't get a lot of laughs, which is very frustrating when you're a professional comedian and you tell a joke <laughs> and no one laughs at it. And it's and you, you can leave the room and go somewhere else and everyone, everyone will laugh, laugh, but no one will laugh at home. That, that's really, you guys weren't a good audience? Because I, I was married to a comedian, I was a good audience. Well, my mom is a pretty good, but my mom still laughs at my dad's jokes yeah, every fine. now and then. But there's a lot of it is sort of like, my dad will say something, you know, crazy. We'll be, we'll be, we'll be going to, uh, um, I don't know, dinner, and he says, "Where should we? Where should we go to dinner?" And he'll crack a joke like, "Well, why don't we? You know, why don't we forge our own food?" <laughs> and my mom's, "No, no, where are we going for dinner?" Like, it's, she'll, or she'll just ignore him and right. just go like, "You know what? I think I think Factors is a good place." She wouldn't even say, acknowledge that he did a joke. <laughs> It will just like to go on to the next thing to finish the point of what we're talking about. And then my dad will say, I just made, I said forge for food. No one forges for food. And, uh, he, wants, he wants some reaction. He, want, he wants a reaction. Like all comedians. Of, of course. You want to laugh. So you guys were giving him a hard time. Do, do you have siblings? I had a sister who okay. died about That's two hard. years ago. Well, for a while I blamed you. I no longer do. So <laughs> we're cool. Thank you getting me off the hook. We're cool. So what, so... Sitting around the dinner table, are, are you being funny when you're a little kid? Yes, I am are being. Are they very, laughing at you? My, I got, I got my dad. My sister was not happy with me, but my, my mom, my dad, my dad especially. I wanted my dad's approval, of course. and so being funny was like tantamount to saying you're a good boy. So I would try to be funny a lot, and it worked. And did your? He still thinks I'm a good boy. That's a sweet. Thing. Yeah. It's did did your friends laugh at your father? Yes, I think my friends, like both my parents... Your like, friends had to think your home was pretty cool. No, I mean, just, I think they just like... They, well, I mean, we're just schlubs in Encino, but like, like they, they they thought nobody... But they, you're they, going 12 year olds don't care what 40-year-old people think, period. Well, yeah, but you're go, you were going on sets. Like, you, you, you... What sets did you get to visit when you were... When I was a very young child, yeah. I got to go on the Dean Martin show, and I was actually on the Dean Martin show okay, with so, Dean Martin. Well, okay, so what was that? What, ha what was that? Was that was awesome. I, it was a Christmas special, Yeah. and my sister and I, they needed kids, Yeah. and so they brought the kids of the writers and kids of people on the show, and so I was there with a, a Melissa Gilbert and Sarah Gilbert, whose father was, or grandfather was Harry Crane, a famous writer who was on, on the... Used to work with Dean Martin a lot. Uh -huh. They were there, and Dom DeLuise's kids, who all became actors and directors, were there. And we didn't know at the time, of course, they've got to be show business people. Right. But they were, and my sister and I, and we had Dennis Weaver and Dean Martin sing some sort of Christmas song with us to the Jewish kids. To the Jewish kids. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing: Dean Martin's deal was he didn't show up. He doesn't show up for rehearsal. He just shows up for the show. So there was a guy like an AD and Dennis Weaver. 
practicing the song. So my sister and I thought, okay, that's the show. It's this guy with the headset and Dennis Weaver. Did you guys know who Dean Martin was? Not really. Yeah. But it was okay. So the yeah. guy with the headset seemed pretty talented. So maybe that was his show. And then <laughs> later on, this guy with bow tie and tuxedo comes and the audience comes and they all applaud him. And, uh, and Dean Martin comes and sings. He picks my sister up and sings right to her. Aww. And I just thought it was the coolest environment that this was my dad's job. And it stuck with me. I remember very strong memories of going to NBC Burbank and remembering those studios and just saying, this is weird. This is so fun. Next door was game shows and just giant pinball machines and other weird stuff. This is a, a, a seems like a, a toy place. So you were, how old were you when you did this? Five. You were five. Yeah. And so what other sets did you visit when you were a kid? All the, the stuff my dad worked on, the Dean Martin show and the, uh, the Carol Burnett, Burnett show. show. And the Bob Newhart show and the Jackson Five Summer Show and oh, um, the happened. Dean Martin uh, the Tonight Show. My dog was on the Tonight Show with George Siegel guest hosting. That was kind of fun. They needed dogs. My dad was a former writer on the Tonight Show. They just needed dogs who were untrainable for this guy to train. And yeah. so my dog came out and he she would not be trained. <laughs> Buffy would not be trained. She just sat there shaking. Uh, she was not a good stage dog. Not a good stage no. dog. But that was what they wanted. Well, they eventually oh. wanted somebody who, a dog that would listen to the trainer and, and be amazingly trained after after a brief moment in time, but that didn't happen. No. Um, <laughs> but I mean, I was on a lot of uh, TV show sets and I enjoyed them all. It just seemed magical. CBS seemed like a magical place. NBC seemed like a magical place. Um, you know, Paramount and Disney and like the back, back lot. I was on a back lot at Radford. Radford mm -hmm. used to have a good old, old West back lot. And uh -huh. all that I used to play on that. I thought that was so much fun. And I so couldn't wait to bring my movie camera down and make it a fake old western. That's a pretty cool childhood. So, do you remember like a point when you decided this is what I want to do? On the Dean Martin show, when On I was Dean five, Martin I just show. said, That's I'll right. do something. I'll do something here. I don't know what I'll be. You know, I'll wear the headset. Maybe I'll be behind the camera. Maybe I'll be one of those light guys. Maybe I'll, I just, this seems like a fun place to work. So, I just figured I'll find a way to work in that. And so, did you is that you had? Did you have a plan B? Was there ever a plan B? Yes. What was plan B? When I was, I think, nineteen. I well, I, I always had jobs like a delivery boy or you know working for an escrow company. And I worked for my well, sister I, for a while. And, you, an escrow company. Yeah. How old? Then I could drive. Yeah. Sixteen, seventeen okay, years so you're old. Not like a kid, kid. No, but I would deliver it. Yeah. I worked at a Crown Books bookstore as a uh -huh. clerk. I worked at a movie theater as a clerk. I did all these jobs. And, and one, my best job was working in a record warehouse, a warehouse that sold, you know, the uh, record albums. Mm -hmm. when they were, before they were returned to the record company, they would sit in this warehouse. And my job was to sort of mark them, box them, and put them in. They would pay me, I forget, it was something like $7 an hour, which at the time was a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, and I thought, you know what? I could live on $7 an hour working in a warehouse marking boxes and so plan b was working in a warehouse taping up boxes that was plan b like i knew i could still you know i'd have enough money for rent i could have enough money for a uh, gas and maybe see some movies and i said that was a good plan b how old were you like 18 19. okay so you're already like okay you know during right. college while well, i was yeah. going to college i thought well if nothing else works out i know i can work in a in a in a box place in a okay place. so what's the what what are you, are you doing plays in school? What are you doing to be I creative? was a great Nathan Detroit. I bet you uh, were. I wrote plays in school when I was in seventh grade and eighth grade and I was in I was uh, in play, some of the plays. How um, did the whole writing thing start for you? Professionally? It, no. Like, is it, like, did you have a passion for it? As oh, a no. Kid? No? Still don't. No. No. I mean, uh, here's the thing. I was like, nobody likes writing. Writing's a miserable fucking job. Nobody likes it. Do you like writing? You wrote this book. Did you it's, sit there every day and go like, Okay, I cannot wait. You're trying to get me to sit down. It's getting to sit down. Yeah, it's miserable. Part. Sometimes it's fun after a while if you get some Once speed. Once in the row, yeah. Yeah, but, yeah. but just, the, the sitting little, down is really hard. It's painful and it's yeah. hard. So, uh, and you gotta, to make it worthwhile, you gotta dredge up stuff. It's not always fun. So, no, I didn't like writing. What I wanted to be was an actor or stand up comedian. And who, I. Who, who were your heroes when you were a kid? Who'd you love? Who made you laugh? George Carlin, okay. Monty Python, mm -hmm. Bill Cosby, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of Steve Martin, Robin Williams, mm -hmm. 
you know, all the groundings. We talked about the ground, the groundings. <laughs> well, we'll talk about the groundings. So, when you started doing stand up, what did your act look like? How old were you when you started doing stand up? Like 15, 16 years old, and I did, uh, you know, uh, I did a, a bad stand up act. I, I did. I came out of tuxedo and talked about these kids today and a cigar and pretended I was 75 and really hated young people and was viciously upset about the culture, the current And did culture. people laugh at that? Yeah, yeah it worked. Did, you know, the did first couple of times. Yeah, I had jokes and I had like a patter and it's like a really sort of old school borscht belty kind of act. Uh-huh. Uh, purposefully uh-huh. uh, borscht belty kind of act. And so it was fun for those who got it and then I did it once or twice for those who did not get it at all. It would, you know, when you go up two in the morning at the improv when it's everybody's brutal. tired it's brutal no matter what nobody mm-hmm. really wants to see you and they certainly don't want to see a kid in a tuxedo they're not really for that so uh, I bombed quite a few times but you know I had that and I did other jokes I did straight jokes and things I, I worked Danny Simon had a, had a comedy class and at that comedy class he kept talking about how his brother was so successful Neil Simon and he was mm-hmm. uh, and he also talked about how he wrote many jokes Danny Simon wrote many jokes and he taught me yeah, you know, one of the exercises was write jokes for for uh, Joan Rivers, write jokes for Rodney Dangerfield, and uh-huh. write jokes for um, there was a third comedian, Henny Youngman or something like that. Uh-huh. And so you had to sort of get into their heads and figure out what the, their style that of jokes smart. were. Sure. And so I once I figured out I could do a page of jokes for that style, a page of jokes for this stuff, I writing jokes became easy. Did your father? Did you learn from your father by listening to him? Yes. He's funny. Yeah. yeah, my dad is funny, and I can do my. So you fun. learned how to craft a joke, kind of? Do you think? I can do his jokes instantly, but I mean, it's like it, his style of joke. But um, yeah, I, I think from listening to all kind, Bob Newhart and mm-hmm. and uh, you know any you know Leno and Seinfeld and all these great comedians who were existing and and Robert Klein and and uh, uh, David Steinberg and all these. Mm-hmm. I listened to everything. I was a sponge for all comedy everywhere, and I knew all the jokes. And I used to Tody Fields. I love Tody Fields. My dad Fields. used to work for Tody Fields. Mm-hmm. I used to listen oh, to yeah, her. Your da- and your dad and Jan Murray and my brother's named after yeah. him. So you, your dad used to write for comics. Yeah. So that kind of training of write a page for this one it kind of was. Well, I, he of, didn't show me. He didn't want me to be a writer. So, but I learned it uh, by osmosis. Why didn't one, Why didn't he want you to be a writer? Well, because it's a shitty job. Like it's a hard lifestyle. To he wanted me originally to be a, a, a lawyer or an agent or something where you'd have a very steady income that's much safer. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I get that. And my son is now a musician. And I keep thinking, you know, a lawyer is not so bad, and an agent's not so bad, and it's like, you know, these things are much safer. But he's uh, currently a musician. I want, I want everybody on Please this. Please tell, promote his, okay. his album. My son's name is Charlie Cogan, mm-hmm. and he has a new album out. Everywhere you get your music on Spotify and Apple Music and Amazon, it's called Songs from the Front Seat. And so you need to listen to Charlie Cogan, K O G E N. Search it, play it, and if you don't love, at least. There are 10 songs in the album. If you don't love four of them, write me and tell me I'm full of shit. My email is J-A-Y-K-O-G-E-N at AOL.com. So you can write me hate mail about how much you don't like my son's music. But you won't because you will like at least four, and I say more, of the songs. They're great songs. They are. And he's 18 years old. He just he, he made this album when he's 17 years old, and it sounds like you know something that, that much older people would make. It also harkens back to an era mm-hmm. of like, the 80s and 70s it's not currently today's music it's it some of it is but a lot of it's really sort of old school mm-hmm. eagles ballads like i can hear a million different influences of dusty springfield and van morrison and did he and, listen to all that music yes that, yeah. he's a, he's like he listens to comedy too by the way like i used to but he also listens to is every bit of music oh he's very funny yeah he's written award-winning comedy plays and stuff like that he's really funny. how fabulous yes uh, and so he might How be a writer too. What, what kind of award winning play? Well, he wrote, there's a one act play festival at a school, mm-hmm. and he wrote, first year he wrote a play and it didn't get accepted. Second year he wrote a play and it was great. And the third year he wrote a play and it won the award for the, 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 the festival. So that's the award. And then he, you know, so he's a, he can write and he mm-hmm. really knows a joke. Mm-hmm. He knows how to tell a story, knows how to tell characters, and he'll only get better if he wants to do it. So we'll see. But you know, so but he's not going to school for that. No, he's going to school to sort of learn everything else, which is really nice to become a better artist. That was the idea. He'll become a better artist by being 
more well-rounded. well-rounded, learning more about art, learning more about literature, learning more about politics, learning more about mm -hmm. science, learning more about everything, philosophy. What, when do kids have to declare? Uh, junior year. Okay. So two so years. So he's got now. time to, yeah. to work that out. Yeah, and and he'll still be do studying music. Do they have music? music? Do yes. they have music there? They have a music department, and he'll Which study music. Stanford, yeah. And he'll be studying lots of other things. But the main thing he loves writing songs. He likes singing songs, and Are he's you really musical? good. At it. I will. I would say yes, but not compared to myself. Did you do musical improv? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Phyllis Katz taught me musical improv, and I think I'm very good. I'm the only one. Phyllis doesn't call me to do musical improv, and I was, Rrr. but uh, the, to, be, to be fair, I don't haven't taken her class in about ten years. So she supports the people who are taking her class. But Hi, one day Phyllis. I will come and take her class, and hopefully she'll put me in a song improv. She's Somebody great. was just suggesting that my daughter do that. She's my daughter's into musical theater, and they were saying she should take a musical improv class. She should. Yes. There, it's great. And and Phyllis was a great teacher for like she basically taught. Um, it's like a magic trick. I mean, it's really not that hard, but it's a, it is a magic trick to be able to stand up and be able to anticipate the rhymes mm -hmm. of that you have to, you know, if it's A, B, C, B, mm -hmm. then you know that the, the subject matter is uh, watermelon. Mm -hmm. And then, so you know you're going to be singing about watermelon. Then you know maybe you'll want to say something like arm in the first thing, like, I can, I've, you know, I've, I've been growing watermelons, I've been growing watermelons, watermelons as big as my arm, because you know at the end, you say it's a delicious summer treat, and it's something we all like to eat, and I'm rhyming in the middle, you don't have to, uh, because I grow it on my farm. So as long as you have arm and farm you're walking in, you're good. Uh -huh. You just have to remember those two, those two rhymes. Now every song improv I see now, or not every, often I see a song improv, where people don't rhyme at all, and I want to punch them. You and I think that's rhyme. that's the only trick. That's the only thing that's hard about it is making that little rhyme. Is having holding on to something that makes sense just a little bit. But no, everybody thinks it's more just about committing to the performance of being a singer. And but it's I, not about that because you don't have to be a great singer to, to do music. No, improv. but but you do have to commit to yes. do great improv. But yes. in addition to doing that mm -hmm. in song improv. You should rhyme. You should rhyme. Just I'm rhyme. I'm not argue with that. Four, there are three verses, mm -hmm. or th two verses and a chorus and a verse. That's four rhymes. Make, give yourself an easy word. Eat, you know, <laughs> dock, whatever it is. They're, they're rhymes. Don't say, you know, orange. Don't say words that are really hard to rhyme. And you'll seem like a genius. That's the magic trick. I don't understand people who sing a song improv and don't rhyme and, and why the audience even doesn't boo them off the stage. Does the audience, does it work when of, they don't rhyme? Of course it does. It does. Because they're watching a show and people yeah. are polite and they're yeah, playing, yeah. you know. Yeah, but yeah, it would yeah. rhyme, it gets more of a reaction when they rhyme. My friend Jim Wise, very funny comedian, uh -huh. um, always rhymes. Mm -hmm. And I salute Jim Wise. <laughs> well, there you go. And my son, who's a song improviser, always rhymes. Always rhymes. Now, did he go and do the groundlings and do that whole thing? He did a kid's groundling one summer, but he also took improv. Every high school, for some reason, has improv teams. And they improv. have, um, my kids did, what is that called? It's called uh, it's called something and it's national and I'm forgetting yeah. what it's well, called. Well, his thing it's, was just an improv. It wasn't national. It was just like the improv team. There's two different improv teams on his. One's called the Jack and Apes and the other mm -hmm. one's called the Scene Monkeys and he was in both. Uh -huh. He also played piano for one of them because he's a good song improviser. He can think of music comedy on the spot. Is what I'm thinking of. Yes. My kids did comedy sports. Okay, yeah. that's fun. Yeah. So okay, so you you were doing stand up first. You decide to segue into to improv, to the groundlings. And how many people are switching to porn right now? Like, no. how many people on the internet, not just you watching, Wait. but just like. <laughs> Wait, I haven't even looked to see who's watching and, and what's going on here. So we can say hello to some people. Oh, look at all. So we've got Mary Scott. We've got, hi, Rick Smolke. Rick Smolke, I just want to give a shout out for, uh, he's the one who we did the uh, the veterans uh, PSA for. Oh, hi, Rick. Rick Smolke is my friend, the printer in Chicago. Okay. He's the most philanthropic businessman that I know. He. He has never charged, as a matter of fact, if your son needs liner notes mm -hmm. for a CD, mm -hmm. he's never charged an artist ever. He will print them and do them for your son. He's just a really good man. I'm, I'm going to call my, him. My little, you should. Yeah, I, 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 need record, I, need, I need record album covers. I will, I will connect yeah. you with All him. Right. He did my bookmarks, my, Great. my cards. Rick Smolke of Quick Impressions in Chicago. Anything you need printed, he will get done. And my hairdresser, Nicole Venables, who is doing the hair on Will and Grace currently and on Man with a Plan. But she also does my hair, and she can do your hair. 
She's at the Ruby Begonia Salon. Do you remember the Ruby Begonia? That's before your time. Does the name Ruby Begonia strike a familiar? That's it. I remember was, Sammy Davis saying, used to say. Yeah, yeah, it was that. So I'm anyway, laughing. And she has uh, um, hair crush love fuck off hairspray, which is fantastic. Nicole Vanderbilt, she's wonderful. Okay, we've done business now. So anyway, so Rick's here. Hi, Rick. Jimmy Celeste. Do you know Jimmy? He's a comic. Hi, and Jimmy. I'm from New York. Christina, hi. Ken, hi. Peg, hi. We're saying hello. If there's going to be que see people are, are see. liking that they're um, and you'll let us know if there's questions, yeah. So Michelle Spitz, I know. Do you know Spitz. Michelle? Yep. Okay. Don't forget to include a plug for Charlie. Uh, you're late, Michelle. No, she was. We since before we said anything. So oh, thank you, okay. Michelle. Really? Because I uh, George Miller. He's he, Greg, rather. I'm sorry. Um, Greg Miller, so, I know. Yeah, Greg Miller. So, um, oh All yes, right. being a writer is very tough. Mm. Um, Okay, so Peter being a writer is there. tough. I mean, I know you're probably being sarcastic, but it is tough. It's not that getting paid a lot of money and having people bring you food is tough. That's not <laughs> tough. That's easy. It's actually being responsible to turn in something good is hard. Okay, we're going to talk. We're going to get to the comedy writing in a bit because that that certainly is where you live or a big part of where you live. But um, okay, so so you move from stand up to to improv, and when I asked you before we went on the air, you were saying a lot of it had to do with getting out of bars, being in a community. So tell tell why you made the transition. It was not a good environment for a 16-year-old kid to be in, unless you wanted to really get high and drink. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, because um, I wasn't... Unfortunately, booze and marijuana does nothing for me. So That's a wonderful thing. Uh, like it, doesn't, it just makes me want to be sleepy. It doesn't like make me energetic or creative or fabulous. It makes me boring and a little depressed. So... That's I didn't do it. Yeah. yeah. So instead, I uh, thought I, the Groundlings was a much better spot. And so I used to take classes at the Groundlings. Mm -hmm. And I learned really great things at the Groundlings for writing. And like different characters say different kind of things and talk differently and walk differently and think differently and have different actions. And that if you have an interesting, funny situation, explore it and heighten it and make it even more interesting and give it weight and give it uh, structure and give it stakes. You know, those are good storytelling techniques. And so the Growlings are really doing sketch. Is it is it more sketch well, than improv? Those are, no, in, in an improv, in an improv, which ultimately turns out to be a sketch, based on. But you're not. They're not sitting down and writing it. No, are, no. But a good improviser mm -hmm. is actually adding information mm -hmm. and adding information that will carry the scene forward. And right. either it's positive information or negative information. It's either conflict mm -hmm. or agreement. And it's also agreement is good. Well, it's all agreement's good for improv. But even when it's conflict, it's agreement. Uh -huh. If you say, you know, Daddy, don't hit me. I'll hit you. That's conflict. But really, somebody said you're going to hit me, so right. I'm agreeing while also fighting. So the fighting is an agreement of its own way. But it's okay. also giving structure. Like, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, Daddy. I, I don't know how to tell you this. Adding information, but I'm pregnant. There's a conflict, mm -hmm. and that's interesting. And then, how is it going to resolve? If the scene was, Daddy, I don't know how to tell you this, but I broke your pencil, you can also make that pretty good if the dad says, you broke my pencil, the one pencil that, and he has to justify why the pencil means something so much right. to him that makes it worthwhile as a conflict. Mm -hmm. And that's why you get Seinfeld. Seinfeld is all about, that show Seinfeld is all about making gigantic conflicts out of nothing. Right. And so that's that's a good way to do it too. Have you taught improv? I have tried improv. I can tell. Yeah, and so I, I like it, and I like. I think it's really helpful for uh, actors and the actors on my shows. I encourage them to do improv. I usually start by giving a few days of improv. Oh, really? For them, yeah, just to just loosen them up and get them to know each other and like each other. Nice. And then, um, but I, I think it's good for everybody. I think it's great for writers. I think it's great for people who want to be actors. I think it's great for lawyers. I think it's great for people who want to be salesmen or people who just want to just be out of their environment for a brief moment. You know, it's a team sport. So you get to go do this great team sport. And since I'm not a good athlete, I do improv. So in, so so let's get to that. So, so high school, you're doing school plays? You're writing school plays? I'm, I'm writing a little bit, but mostly I'm trying to be an actor. I audition, I did You already when I was auditioning a kid. out in the world? Yeah, I did roles when I was a little kid. Oh, my, my dad. So my dad would put me in stuff, so I would. I was like, I was on the Dean Martin show. Right. I was on the. I was on the Kermit show, and I was on the, uh, the Bob Newhart show. Did you act the, on? Yeah. So, like, what did you do on the Bob Newhart show? I played a kid named Jay who was waiting in the waiting room of of uh, 
the office area mm -hmm. and the episode was about how Bob's uh, business was not going well. People had been sort of canceling and he was losing clients and he was, people were saying, well, maybe it's the economy, it's in a downturn. And meanwhile, Jerry the dentist is through the roof, the next door neighbor, and I'm one of the kids who's waiting for braces or something. And it's so packed, I have to wait out in the lobby. And Bob has nothing to do, so he's sitting there staring at me and uh, uh, the, the, the waiting room secretary, Marsha, says, do you want to read a magazine? And I say, no, I don't. And then Bob stares at me and says, you want to talk about it? He's that desperate for a uh, patient. <laughs> and so that's it. That's my joke. It was like, I said no. And then he says, you want to talk about it? And I have to look at him like, what this weird guy is saying. How'd you get your SAG card? Um, that way, to, the, yeah. to that show. Yeah. Say no? One, one word? You got you. Just, you well, I had been in a few other things, and then it was so like, it, so you, I had Taft Hartley. Yeah, then, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. So, yes, that, that way. So, I was on, I think it was after before I was Taft, uh, before I was SAG. Mm -hmm. So, I don't And know. so, did you, did you audition when you were in high school? I did. I did audition every now and then. I was not like a professional kid actor. I was like, every now and then there'd be something for me, like, Somebody, Something that your father would open a or door a friend, to? Or, or a friend of my father's. Did you have an agent? No. Okay. Eventually I did. When I was in college, I had an agent. But Where did uh, you go to college? UCLA. And what, what, were you a writer or an actor? What were you at UCLA for? What was your major? My major was for, in the film studies program, and then I dropped out of the film studies program and went through a lot of majors and eventually became a philosophy major. Okay, I thought I heard that. That's very interesting. Yeah, my my father-in-law was a philosophy professor at NYU and come from a long line of philosophers. Oh, and, and that must have been tough on so, holiday dinners. So it was everybody, everybody <laughs> yeah. screaming, everybody right, exactly. fighting. So what, uh, what, how, what drew you to philosophy? Well, the, my problem with the film studies program and my problem with English after mm -hmm. I went to there is you had to please artistically please the teacher to get a good grade. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, that's not fair. It's a very subjective. subjective kind of thing about what's good and what's not good. And at UCLA, what was considered good was non-narrative, expressionistic film art. And I want to tell stories. And I thought, well, that's stupid. And I did not not like that. And we would watch these great movies from Howard Hawks and, mm -hmm. and uh, George Stevens and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, Orson Welles. And then they'd throw all that out. They'd talk about greatness and throw it all away and talk about, you know, the imagery of... of uh, of uh, the expressionists or something like that, and they said, "Well, do that." So you know, you get an A if you wanted to show that tissue box and just hold it and just have people keep taking tissues from it, and eventually one tear, you know, one tear in somebody's thing, and then go put the tissue back, and you get an A. So I could get an A there, but I was really frustrated. Yeah, I would. Hate I didn't. That. I hated that. So in philosophy, you didn't have to be right or wrong. You just had to make a cohesive argument, and that's what's good about. Philosophy. They know you're not going to reach the truth. No philosophy teacher says, we're going to sit here until we get what the truth is. Right. They just say, this is how the arguments go. You, We propose something, and then somebody else proposes something else. And you read great philosophers, mm -hmm. and you try to poke holes in their arguments, and read the other holes that other people poked in their arguments, and they go back and forth. So clearly a good student. UCLA, philosophy. You were good good enough. enough. Good enough to get into UCLA back okay. then. Couldn't have gotten into it now. You, no it's, way. It's very hard. Yeah. It's no, very back then, hard. I didn't need a good... GPA, like an okay B plus GPA really? and a 1300 SAT, 1350 SAT score. They, they showed it. There's like, this is, your, this is your GPA, this is your SAT score. The lower your GPA, the higher your SAT score. Right, I said, right. oh, I could do this and this. And I did. Nice. And I thought I could stay in town and do the groundlings and try okay, to develop so, myself. So, stuff. what were you doing while you were in college? So, you're doing the groundlings. Stand up comedy, groundlings, you trying to act. Stand yeah. So how has your stand-up evolved? It wasn't. It, you're still no. the, you're still the, the guy. With I was the actually tuxedo? working. I was a door. No, I was a. I did without the tuxedo. But I was a doorman at the Improv for mm -hmm. a while, and so I would go on late and do shitty jokes, just jokes, and I wasn't great. It wasn't. It really wasn't good, um, but it was fine. It was interesting. I got to see great comedians. And what see was them. your your first aspiration? Like when you saw yourself being a part of that business. What, what drew you the most? What did you want? Did you want to be a com? Did you want to be a stand-up comic? Did you want to be a great? I wanted to work in the in the business. I'm not. I wasn't looking for valid. The one thing that I can say for myself and mm -hmm. growing up, I wasn't looking for validation from anybody. I wasn't looking for approval. I didn't have to be told, 
you know, your parents made you feel loved and special. Yeah, and you didn't need that stuff. But I just wanted to work. Okay. So like, well, what does it take to work? And so I was always with did an you eye towards. To, did you have a work ethic because of I'm going to earn a living? What yeah, I wanted to get ahead. Okay. In show business. So getting ahead in show business means trying to act. If you can get good parts in shows, then you can be a professional actor. And then when that wasn't going fabulously... What's I was, the best thing you did as an actor? What's the biggest thing you did? The biggest thing? Mm-hmm. They're all little things. I mean, my, the best thing I did was I got shot in the head in a, in a movie and got a laugh by dying. Well, that was well, the okay. best thing I did. It was my friend's... Uh, uh, my partner's movie called Cold-Blooded. Mm-hmm. And I think... I think that's the best thing I did. I got shot in the head uh, wearing a conductor's hat. And I paused just a little too long after getting shot before falling, dropping dead. And so I, 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 the idea was it was a comedy. It right. was a comedy movie. The idea was it was supposed to be funny. And so, like, how do you make that funny? And the blood, there's a <laughs> blood drips down your face. And then I fall down. And it's like, you know, it could have been Scorsese. Yeah. Or it could have been Laurel and Hardy. And I sort of went between. Um, so I was very proud of the, the, my, my timing because I only had one take of it. Because mm-hmm. first the gunshot didn't work and there were only two hats that exploded. So I had to do it in one take. <laughs> I did it in one take. They used that take and I got a laugh. And I was very pleased with myself. On the film set? No. In on, the audience. In the audience. Oh, when people in the audience. You're not film. allowed in the film set. You're not yeah, allowed yeah. to laugh. Okay, so, no, no. okay so, so the audience would laugh. They're film yes. professionals. They're not going to ruin the tape. They're professionals. Exactly. Okay. And Julie so, Warner would like to know where she can find this movie. Hi, Julie. Cold blooded, <laughs> Julie, and I don't know where it is. It's probably on Netflix or you know, is like it? like my no. movie on on uh, my mo- the movie I made. The wrong guy is like on YouTube for free. So maybe it's on YouTube for free. But no, I think cold blooded. Jason it's- Priestley is the star. Wow. Robert Loggia. Oh. Paul Reiser. Uh, not uh, not Paul Reiser. Uh, um, Paul from Animal House. Um, uh, not Lamette. Um, no, from no, Animal House. Uh, um, it's Paul. God damn it, I'm from getting too old. House. Yes, from Peter Riegert. That's not Paul. No, it's Peter Riegert. <laughs> I love him. Uh, and and so, uh, there are lots of good people in that movie. That's, that yes. is... Michael J. Fox was in that movie. Wow, lots of people. that's so good. Yeah. Okay, so I also, have, I also so get a laugh when I take my ears off. I'm the pre-ride film of uh, Soarin' Over California. Yeah. There's a sh- and pre-ride, they say, you know, you have to take off your hat or anything like I have mouse ears and I take them off. Because uh, the the person in the movie says you can't wear the mouse ears, and I sadly take off my mouse ears. And you get a laugh. I do get a laugh. That's a nice thing. Yeah, you get laughs. And I have a lot of recognition from it too. People, really? People text me like, "Hey, are you on the ride at Disneyland?" And yes, I am. <laughs> well, that's very nice. Yes. So, so okay, so you're you're in college, you're doing stand up, you're doing the railings, you're doing some acting. How do you become a writer? How does that happen? Fail at acting and fail at comedy. That's really <laughs> the best way to do it. And the most direct line is do be very bad at those other things. And then uh, try your hand at writing. And so is the first gig the Tracy Ullman show? Yeah. I mean, that, that was hard to get. So, but but, yes, okay, so, all right, so how, and that's, that's a sketch. So, so how did that happen for you? Okay, so I'm working as a production assistant on these TV shows since I was a kid. So I worked, at, while I did other jobs, I also was a production assistant on... You know, Don Kirshner's rock concert, or and the, how are you getting that? Are you getting that through your father, friends, and father, and whatever? The, the, like friends of friends, like do you know anybody who needs anybody? And like, okay, you know. let's talk about that for a minute. Yeah. Are you a good networker for yourself? Because it sounds like you are. I'm unafraid to call anyone for anything. Okay. So that's good, and and people, I got that way because people are unafraid to call me for anything. So I. Being on the other side has given has emboldened me to realize, oh, everybody calls everybody. I don't have to feel like I'm a horrible person for but calling. But you were them. the first. You were calling them before they're calling you. Yeah, right? but shyly and demurely. Like, okay. Like a uh, 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 yes. So so not not as strong as I would do today. But. So for people out there who are embarking on such a thing, I always say, yeah, I can get the people in the living room, but I hate making those. It's torture. Like, do, is it easy for you to to make those calls? No, it's always it's, you know you always sucks. put your. It's like asking someone on a date. You don't want to you know get rejected. rejected or something like that. But in the meantime, what choice do you have? You have to go for it. And so, do you have to psych yourself up for that, or is that something you just? Yeah. 
You have to psych yourself up. I mean, everything about show business is it getting kicked in the teeth. So you got to get psych yourself up for it in, in a million ways, a million rejections. When you're going not to pitch to a pilot, you're going to get told no by most people. They, luckily, if you get one person to say yes, yay, that's great. But most of the time, people are going to get to say, nah, no. And so you have to psych yourself up for the rejection. Everything's a rejection. So you're a kid, you're, you're doing PA work. And I worked on this show called It's Gary Shandling Show, which oh, was a very good show. Gary. And Alan Zwei Bell was, 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 was a fabulous guy. And fabulous. Gary was a group. Uh, was a, was a, you're a PA on that show. Yeah. Uh-huh. And one of the other people who worked on that show as a writing, as a producer, mm -hmm. was named Sam Simon. And Sam Simon, uh, I wrote a, Wally Walidarski and myself wrote mm -hmm. a spec script for the show. How, how old are you? I was in college, like 21, okay. 22. Um, and, and did you study uh, uh, writing for film? Was no. that part of your? No. No. So how, what prepared you to do that? Reading scripts and looking at scripts. And okay. they are. I don't think you have to study writing. Well, uh, well that's what I'm asking. So that people... Yeah, nobody, you don't have to study. Don't go to, don't have to go to film school. You don't have to. Don't have to go to film school. Don't <laughs> have to pick writing courses. What you have to do is write. So if you're taking writing courses makes you write, then writing courses are great. Mm -hmm. If you're taking film courses makes you make movies, then that's good too. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, if you're making movies on your own and you're writing on your own, don't waste your time and money doing those other things. Mm -hmm. uh, writers groups are good. Anything that encourages you, any, anybody who gives you a deadline mm -hmm. and says Deadlines write it, so, that's then 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 you're good. Mm -hmm. So that's what, but so I didn't have that. I took I think I took maybe an extension course in screenwriting from somebody. And it was a terrible course, and it, and it discouraged me from writing anything for years. Did and you did you read books? Did you? I mean, how did you learn structure, three act structure? And in, in sitcom, the th first things I wrote weren't movies; they were okay. TV shows. Mm -hmm. And I'd watch TV shows every single day of my life since I was three years old, so I didn't have to learn structure. <laughs> you learn how it starts. Right. In the middle, more stuff happens, <laughs> and at the end, they wrap it up. They that's how it yeah. goes. And the good ones, the end has something to do with how it started. So it's connected. Those are the good ones. But not every show I watched was about connecting. Some would just start and then have a middle and then have an end. Um, so What's the first her. thing you wrote? First thing I wrote, I think, was a Bob Newhart show spec of a Bob Newhart show. Mm -hmm. Actually, I mean, that first TV show I wrote. And you and wrote this with, 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 with friends. Wally. No. Yeah, I uh -huh. think with friends. Uh -huh. And then with Wally and maybe... Billy Ray, I'm trying to remember. Well, Billy Ray and, and I, who's a famous screenwriter now, also we wrote together when we were kids. And uh, I'm not exactly sure what we wrote. I think we wrote a variety show at one point, mm. and then we wrote some uh, sitcom. But maybe it was Wally and me writing this this Bob Newhart show. My dad was a pr producer on the Bob Newhart show, so I gave it to my dad. Okay. 14 or 15 years old. He said, Dad, read my new Newhart. And he reads it and he goes like, this is shit. This is terrible. <laughs> Did you really? Well, he didn't say it like that. He's too nice to say it yeah. like that. But he... That's what he meant. Was he trying he, to discourage you, or did was no, it no, no? Shit? It, was, it shit. was shit. It was absolutely shit. So, but but if you had a but my son brought to me a script that was shit, I would I don't know how clearly I would say it was shit. I would try like this is good. This part, this is good. Here's good. But there was nothing good about it. And he said this is not really good. It's not close. It's not close. You got to really try again if you want okay. to do it. Um, and so, did he tell you what was wrong with it? Everything was wrong with it, <laughs> and I'm sure he's right. Everything was wrong, with it. and I'm not kidding. I was like, everything was probably wrong with it. But it takes a long time to. You have to write a bunch of stuff okay, to get so good. Okay, so how? What was the learning? If everything is shit, how do you know how to make something better? I don't know. Well, we watched when I started writing spec scripts for It's Gary Shandling Show, mm -hmm. I'd worked on the show, I'd seen every episode of it, mm -hmm. I'd seen every script of it, every rewrite of it, uh -huh. and so i go like, okay, well, that's that style I know, and that format, I'm in charge of Xeroxing every script, so I see the format, right. there are no commercials, um, so I can do that, and I see that the names go in capital letters mm -hmm. above the dialogue, which is a little wider, we could do that, so I figured out they how to do that. They didn't have Final Draft in those days, probably. They didn't. Oh, they didn't. Yeah. They, had, they had something called WordStar. Okay. And WordStar was like you'd press a button and it would go to the right, uh, oh, okay. the, 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 the right paragraph, the right uh, format for mm -hmm. dialogue and the right format for character. So we wrote in WordStar and I wrote it. It's a script for It's Gary Shandling's show. And then 
they hated it. No, they didn't hate it. They thought it was good, but they're not good enough to buy it or make us writers. Okay. Uh, and then they said... You're still in college. Oh, you're still yeah. a kid. Okay. And then in college. Mm -hmm. And then we wrote another one uh, six months later. Mm -hmm. And then they still didn't like that. They said it was better. Mm -hmm. But Sam Simon liked it mm -hmm. and showed it to his boss, Jim Brooks. And James L. Brooks said, bring him in. You know, and nobody, nobody went, nobody threw us a parade. They didn't say, like, I thought they... What years later, about? years later, I at the time I thought they loved us. Oh my God! They finally saw my genius. This is so great. And then they brought us in, and when we sold the thing, and then, and then we wrote it, and then they got hired. That my my story about it was we were geniuses and finally recognized. The real story is we kind of were okay, and they saw enough potential to give us a shot, and then we did that. And so, so you got st you from that script. You got a staff job on. You both got a staff job on Tracy Ullman. We wrote one sketch for Tracy Ullman show. We pitched a bunch. They said write that one. We wrote one. They they called us back after we turned it in the next day. The Jerry Belson, very famous mm -hmm. comedy writer, left me a message on my machine saying, "All right, Bubby, you're hired on the show. You're going to be rich and miserable for the rest of your life." And we wow. went. That sounds good. Rich and miserable sounds good. So now when you were on Tracy Ullman, were you writing for The Simpsons? That Were you writing those Simpsons things then, or did no, that come later? No, other people were writing those little shorts mm -hmm. later on. And then when the show became, be, became a real thing, that's when we started writing the show. Uh, Sam Simon and Matt Groening and Jim Brooks were sort of developing the show, and we were around when they were actually developing it, and that was kind of fun. And then they said, you guys should write some for us, and so we did. And so you win an Emmy. An Emmy for the Tracy Owen show. You win an Emmy, for and the Tracy then Owen. two or a couple. And we should have run two. We were our names were left off a list, so we didn't get to win the second Emmy. What? And then, what? Yeah, that's happened to me a couple times. Really? But yeah, but uh, then so I won that one for them and one okay, for the so Simpsons. Okay, so wait, so what's that like? So now you you're a TV writer. So yeah. are you still now? You're still doing improv now. So are you still trying to be an actor? Are you still doing improv? Are you still doing stand up? Well, you know, doing? secretly when you work on a TV show, you hope they say, you know what, you should play that part. <laughs> And yeah. you're like, oh, really? Yeah. And then you hope that that happens, but that never happens. Not, and did you not do anything on the Tracy Ullman show? Never. 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 And I made a, a rule that I would never put myself in anything. Okay. Because otherwise, I would put myself in everything. <laughs> and then that would be bad. Um, <laughs> and I'm proof bad. to the world. The world has proven that I'm not great. So don't, I'm ta I'd be taking the place of somebody much better. So that's not good. And somebody who needs the job. Have you accepted that about yourself? No, I think I'm really fucking good, but okay, this but, is what I'm but 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 so you're dating I have a job. Oh yeah, I have a job. If I'm executive producer, I have a job. Why should I take a job away from somebody else? Okay. And then anyway, I can sit back and see. Do I like that performance? I can make adjustments. It's hard to make adjustments on yourself. Is there still sort of a, a dream that maybe I would I would act in a heartbeat. I've had the a rule, which is if you ask me to be anyone, if you ask me to be in your show. I will be in your show. I will know my lines. I will show up on time, and I will do it no matter how degrading. I will be there on time. You know, you're rapist number three. Great, no worries. I'm there. You know, it's like you know, you die in a barrel full of manure. Okay, sounds interesting. Let's. Do, what what time do I I show up? I'll bring my own clothes. Good. Um, so I still want to do it. Yeah. But you know, it doesn't pay the rent. So, um, so I don't. Okay. So how was it? Getting that first Emmy nomination. Fun. Emmys, I learned very quickly. Emmy awards are Did you read your fun. first one? Your first nomination? I don't think we did. Okay. I remember being, I remember going and losing the mm -hmm. first time. Mm -hmm. And then winning the second time. Mm -hmm. And remembering that winning is so much more fun than so losing. So much more yeah. fun. Yeah. And, and, uh, and that was a lot of fun. But yeah, that's, that's fun. It also, very clearly, the best shows don't win those awards. Mm -hmm. Like, winning an award is not a sign that you are in fact working on the best show. It's a sign that you were the best, you were one out of five that got lucky that particular time. Mm -hmm. And so, so the fun is walking around with the trophy and getting drunk and showing people your trophy and, and then going home. That's it, is you can't, you can't take too deep a bow mm -hmm. for it. I but mean, you've won four. I have. And you've been nominated seven more times, is that correct? I think I've been nominated 14 times. 14? Yeah. 14 times, yes. aside from the four that you won? A total, so maybe, total. Or, okay. so maybe so 10, ten, more. 10 more times. 10 yeah. more times. 
Not that and, I'm and, counting. And winning each time, much more fun than the nods. Yeah, and the odds yeah. are one out of five, so that's about right. Those yeah. are the averages. Four, yeah. you know, I won four and lost ten. Okay. You know, yeah. that's good. That's very good average. Yeah. And so, okay, so you do the Tracy Ullman show, and then is it right into the Simpsons from that? What, what, yeah. What? And so now, what is that like? Because you're not dealing with actors, you're well. You are. You are dealing, you with, are actors. dealing with actors. Julie Actually, Werner's out there. Yes. She knows one of the actors I was dealing with. Yes. She knows. Um, uh, 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 yeah, it's 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 fun, mm -hmm. but it's fun. But uh, but the actors, you know, people say you don't deal. With, of course, you deal with actors, yes, and the actors created a ton of what's great about the show. They mm -hmm. they brought to life these dumb things that we were thinking about, and they gave. In, embodied the these weird dra lifeless drawings with humanity and they're fabulous and they had real opinions about what the characters would and wouldn't do mm -hmm. and they would come to us and say you know this Lisa would not Yardley Smith would, would say Lisa would not do this and we'd be pissed off at her saying what the hell does she know and of course she's right you know there's there's an integrity to the character and you have to listen to the actor who's playing that character and believe that they've sort of thought about what the character would and wouldn't do you sort of have to suss out between what the actor would and wouldn't do and what the character wouldn't do. But most of the time, they are truly protecting the character. Speaking of protecting the character, I met Dan at Phil Rosenthal's a few times, mm -hmm. and he does not like to be photographed. Dan Castellaneta? Yes, and he okay. does not like to be photographed uh -huh. as Dan because he has such a big persona as Homer. And um, like he won't, he won't do the Homer voice as Dan. Is what it was. He doesn't. He doesn't want to do the home. You mean he won't? Voice. He won't be, go on camera. Yes. And be recorded. Saying, yes. Yes. Like, there's right. lots of photographs of Dan. He's right. Not like no. 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 A no. Vampire. Right. But not being Homer. Yeah. Right. Because he's very protective. Yeah. Of he doesn't that. want to say it and be seen ruining yes. the magic. Right. right. He doesn't want to ruin the magic. Yeah. Very okay. Protective I get of that, that. Of that thing. So, do you have like a favorite? Did you ever write something for The Simpsons that you like? This is fucking brilliant. Like. Everything I wrote for The Simpsons was fucking brilliant. Did, did you? Every time have, I write do you, something, do you have a favorite thing that you wrote for The Simpsons that I have favorite episodes and favorite moments, and I like. Uh, but but yeah, they're, they're everything. The the we we had Homer jumping over a gorge, Springfield Gorge mm -hmm. on a skateboard, because Bart was going to do it, and that's one of my favorite things that we ever did, which was Homer jumping a gorge and then missing, mm -hmm. and then falling down a mountain and really hurting himself. Bloody hospital broken, like not cartoon hurting, but really hurting himself uh, near death. Mm -hmm. That was one of my favorite things. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. Okay, so so why did you not stay there? Why did you move on from the Simpsons? From the Simpsons. What's it your business? <laughs> Jesus. No, none of this is my okay. business. Okay. I don't care. Lots of questions that are none of none of it's my um, business. Uh, but the reason I left was. Yeah. That my partner and I were being offered truckloads of money to go develop TV shows elsewhere. Okay. The show was red hot, and they said cash in and go develop and go make a development deal. So we did. And how was that? Uh, very lucrative mm -hmm. and, and very uh, creatively unsatisfying. Was it? Yeah, because we were we had come off of the show where you could do anything you wanted and people adored it, and then we said, well, you know what else we'll do? Something else we really want to do, and then it was very hard to sell that. It was very hard to get networks to buy it, to believe that it would happen again if they took a chance on it. They wanted things that were, you know, they were more concerned with likability and relatability, not what was funny. Mm -hmm. We were about funny, and we said, the relatability had come. Simpsons is relatable, but it's mostly funny. It's like, well, no, but that's not how it works here. Mm -hmm. Start with relatable, start with uh, uh, likable. And so it was very disheartening to try and do something edgy and weird and try to sell it. And so we learned quickly that that was very hard. Mm -hmm. And that was a little dis disheartening and actually made my writing partner want to leave that part of our business. And so I became a single after that. Uh -huh. So now when you became a single, did you have to start, like, write a spec script? Yeah. yeah. Oh, so what was the first spec script? A news radio spec script. Uh -huh. And I, uh, I actually got to a job for several weeks on news radio mm -hmm. based on a spec script. It was great. Paul Sims let me come work there. And then it was like very hard to work, there, so I left. But it was it was good, good, interesting, interesting to be there for a little bit. And then where'd you go after that on your own? Um, I was offered a great job at Frasier or Seinfeld to work at either one of those places, the two best shows on television at the time. And they said, which one do you want to do? And what and made you choose Frasier? I didn't. 
I choose the single guy at that moment. Wait, what? Yeah, I know. How stupid, right? Wait, wait, Why would you go to the single guy? This, that You're wasn't part of the equation. Idiot. But it was because uh, Jamie Tarsus at NBC mm -hmm. said, come work. Warren Littlefield wants this show to work and you come work here and we'll give you a put pilot and your own show. The, all the things I couldn't get when I was on my develop, development deal, right. I might be able to get at NBC by working on the single guy. So I said, okay. That will be at least pleasurable to work on the single guy and then get my weird show that's not relatable made uh, it's a put pilot uh, and once I got Michael Palin to star as my lead character um, I would get they would see how relatable and adorable he is because Michael Palin's adorable adorable um, and so I wrote this thing about this complete asshole called my dad's an idiot and it was uh, uh, featuring you know a guy who is a network executive who's a horrible idiot and for some reason the network didn't like it <laughs> I don't know why they didn't like it I still to this day I don't know why um, and they didn't let Michael Palin do it, and they didn't let anybody do it, and they didn't make it. And so the, 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 the torturous year of working on The Single Guy, which wasn't that torturous. It was, I, it was just wasn't working on Simpsons and Frasier, but right. I actually met some wonderful people there, mm -hmm. and the guy who created Brad Hall is a genius, wonderful guy. I love and Brad Jonathan Hall. Silverman's a mm -hmm. beautiful, wonderful guy, and I got to meet Ernest Borgnine, and I got to meet a bunch of great writers and all that kind of stuff, but the show itself wasn't as funny as it needed to be. Mm -hmm. And people were calling me from the network, calling me, not Brad Hall, saying, you gotta help make it funnier. And I said, well, Brad Hall's making a show that he wants to make, it's his show. I'm helping him make the show he wants to make, you gotta make it funnier. It's, 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 he doesn't want it to be that broad. He wants it to be more like life. And talk to him. And so, I don't know whether they, they talk to him or not. But anyway, after that first year, I left. And I said, I can't, I can't do what they want me to do. And I left, and then I got a job offer again at Single Guy, at uh, Simpsons and uh, not Simpsons, Seinfeld and Frasier. They offered me again. And, Sophie's choice. And I picked Frasier because Frasier was uh, was considered at the time less broad, smarter, and less broad. Even though they're both really smart and they're really both smart. really broad, mm -hmm. but Seinfeld was considered more cartoony, and so. And, and Frasier was the one that considered somehow classier. I don't know why. Both shows were brilliant. Mm -hmm. Both shows were great. But... Well, Frasier had a sophistication. Uh, so did Seinfeld. So, so did Seinfeld in, 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 different, in a different way. Yeah. They had, they had the snooty... Anyway, coming from off The Simpsons, I look at my resume, I thought, oh. Frasier would be a better, more interesting addition to my resume than going oh. from The Simpsons to Seinfeld. I see. Simpsons to Seinfeld seems like more of a direct path. Mm -hmm. There's something a little bit interesting about working with a great cast and seeing how they're going to make those, you know, those pro actors, not comedians, are going to do it and all this good stuff versus the Seinfeld people who were also great actors but somehow considered more comedic and sillier right. or so, what, what have you. Anyway, it was a Sophie's Choice. They're both great. And um, I, I really enjoyed my time at Frasier. That was great. I thought it was a good choice. Win another Emmy. I won two. Two more two Emmys. Two more Emmys. So Tracy Ullman and... and, and Simpsons and, and two Frasers. And that's when the gravy train stopped. I mean, it, uh, that's when the winning stopped. I still got more uh, nominations, but mm -hmm. that's my last award was like, in, you know, 1924. <laughs> and so that's fine. I have one more than my father. That's all that counts. Do you really? I just have one more than my dad, yes. Does, does that come up in conversation? When I oh, have something to say about it. it. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, no, they're very proud. My parents are very say, proud. Okay, I, so I was going to say, at what point did your father get behind? What Immediately. You were doing? Yeah. Immediately. As soon as I got a job in the Tracy Home, he was thrilled. I mean, he was, and he was very supportive. Honestly, I say, I talk about him not liking my my shitty, shitty Newhart script. How could your father not like? Because my father loved me, and he wanted to be honest with me and 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 teach me how to write. You want to be writing? Teach me how to write. Did Did he do that at all? Did he ever Did he ever give you suggestions? He gave me notes. Yeah, yeah. He gave me okay. notes. He uh -huh. said, "This is what's shitty about it," and that's uh -huh. actually quite helpful. Absolutely. When you write something bad, mm -hmm. you should know why it's bad, mm -hmm. um, and or at least why he thinks it's bad. What did your father win his Emmys for? Uh, the Cover Net Show, mm -hmm. mostly for the Cover Net Show. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, you have to figure out what. Not every criticism is right. Mm -hmm. Not everything he, professional writer says is right. But mm -hmm. those are my dad's opinions, mm -hmm. and they they count. And I still show him everything I write when do I do. I do, and I get his opinion. And sometimes I agree, and sometimes I don't agree. But I, uh, you know, I, the last pilot I just wrote that's going out to a lot of people today nice. um, has the ref, as a reference to DJ Khaled, 
And my dad said, no one's going to know who DJ Khaled is. And it's like, he's right about you. You don't know who I, DJ I Khaled know. is. Uh, internet. Tell me who who of you knows who DJ Khaled is. Okay, so we're uh, so Jay just put out a question. Let's see if anybody comes up on the thread and can answer What's that. What's the best question? advice you can give to a newbie writer? That's a good question. Well, I will give that. Yes, and and I wanted to ask you about your process too. Do you have a daily practice? Um, I have a daily intention to write. <laughs> That's my daily intention to write. Yes. But I fill it up with stuff like this. Driving to Montrose and you know sitting in traffic and wherever it was like yeah. No, but seriously though, let, let, when you're on a when you're on a show, yes. like you just came off School of Rock, that right. was mostly recent, right? Yes. So what's your day like? Well, when you're running a show, it's different than when you're writing. When you're sitting at home writing, that's like being an independent contractor and it's when all you're different writing life. a pilot. When you're writing okay, a pilot. Okay, so so what's your daily practice when you're writing a pilot? Um, find out when they need it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then sit on your ass for a while until they really and think about it. So do the laundry. Go yeah, to the think about it. What's the figure out what the story really is? I, I outline and I outline and okay, I outline, you outline. Okay. and I outline again and I outline again and then when I got an outline that's fully baked and and shown to friends, mm -hmm. they've given me notes on my outline. Then shown to a network, they've given me notes on my outline, and then I can feel good about going ahead and write. Then I write it. And then I was just in this process. I've written a, a different script uh, that doesn't have DJ Khaled in it, mm -hmm. and and I got notes on that. Uh -huh. uh, and now I have to finish those notes. And I asked the network, "Is when you need it?" He said, eh, three weeks." So it's been about a week. I've done nothing on that. Okay. So all right. So what what? How late are you gonna wait until you're I'm, gonna? I'm grab thinking it. about. There's a story issue that's in on. That's a real problem that I have to fix, and I don't have room to write. A lot of story changes to make it work. So I have, it's hard to speak in these vagaries, but mm -hmm. the point is a character has to get mad at her friends mm -hmm. and then say something horrible about them. They overhear her and then she has to apologize. Mm -hmm. The reason she gets mad at her friends right now is this small. Mm -hmm. It has to be much bigger, mm -hmm. but it can't take up too much script space. Right. I have no room to tell it. So how do I do it fast? How do I do it without adding another scene or at least two other scenes? It's a problem. Uh -huh. So I'm trying to work that out. Once I've worked that out, I can do then, all the notes do it fast. in a day. I mean, and if this was and if this was a, a, a rewrite of a real show, uh -huh. I'd do it in a few hours. Uh -huh. There'd be no, there'd be the rush to get a script out tomorrow. Right. So we'd all sit around and we'd say, what is the solution? And we'd take the best solution, whether it's fabulous or not, mm -hmm. take the best version, mm -hmm. and hopefully it's good enough or we'd stay until it was great. And then... We do it. So I can do this very quickly. Since they don't need it very fast, I have other things to write. So I'm doing those things too. So what else are you writing? I have an animatic. I'm doing an animated show pitch that I need to write an animatic for that show. That's a little movie, tiny little stiff animated movie. So the artists are going to draw something as a sample of what the show might look like. Mm -hmm. So I have to write that scenes, that scene or scenes. I'm also writing... Uh, 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 synopsis for other pilots that I'm trying to sell another world. So you're here. writing every day, basically. I'm writing all the time, or meeting on things all the time, or meeting with actors or actresses, or trying to find, or directors or producers or other people trying to sort of get stuff going. So when you actually sit down, yes, in your day, yes, what might a writing day? What might that be for you? An hour, six hours, might it vary depending on what needs to get done? A good rule of thumb, the minimum is five pages. If you sit down and you've written five pages, that's like minimum. I will sit down, I will write something that's five pages and I will feel like I've done a good day's work. And it almost never is at five pages. It's always winds up being 10, 15 pages. What's your, where in your day does that happen usually? Like, do you have do you have a routine? Like, do you get up and say, okay, first thing I'm gonna no. sit down and write. I get up and I say to my my wife and my son, what do you want to do today? <laughs> want to go to the movies? Let's go to the movies. Hobbs and Shaw is out and it's supposed to be hysterical. It's supposed to be so bad it's great. Let's go see Hobbs and Shaw. And then my 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 wife and my son stare at me like I'm not gonna go see Hobbs and Shaw. And then. I feel bad posting on Facebook, who wants to go see Hobbs and Shaw? So then I don't go see Hobbs and Shaw, and then I go to a cafe, and I sit and I write. Oh, you go to a cafe to write? Yeah. Okay. I go to a place that has lots of iced tea. I like to write with iced tea. When you get up and go to the bathroom, do you leave your computer there? I do. 
I, I wonder about that. I leave my computer. Yeah, okay. and my book bag and everything. Yeah. You leave everything. Yeah. And that's never been. I'm on the street. Uh -huh. I'm and on the, this, this particular cafe. Outside, I sit in the street. outside, outside. And you just leave everything. Yes. Am I an idiot? No, I, but I can't do that. I, I take it with me. Why? But it, I'm paranoid. I'm Jewish. I'm from New York. You can't even do the thing where you lean into somebody else and say, hey, I'm going to the bathroom. Can you watch this? You know, yeah, I've done that. Okay. I, I've, I've done the lean in. I don't this. even lean in, but people lean into me and say, well, you watch it. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've done the lean in. Have you ever done the thing where somebody leans in and says, will you watch it and then stolen their stuff? <laughs> I do that all the time. Oh, my God. They're so surprised. And they say, you were supposed to watch. No, I didn't. Oh, I forgot. Did somebody take it? Yeah. <laughs> no, I, don't, I won't do the lean in with you. Okay, all right. I'll never do the lean in with you. I return so, the stuff. Uh, I return the stuff. So, so, all right. Nobody Pete. knows who DJ Khaled is. Has anybody said Pete? I don't know. Has anybody said Pete? No, has, has anybody said, said who DJ Khaled is? Oh, yeah, he's a rapper. Yeah. He's a, not only is he a rapper, he's a DJ. He's, it's not really a rapper. Mm -hmm. He's a music producer, mm -hmm. and his job it seems, is to organize really talented other rappers and then say, introduce them. Here comes Little Mo! And then Little Mo comes on and he says something. And then he'll say, DJ Khaled! And he screams his name over everybody's songs. That's his job. That's what he does. That's his thing. And he's he like a, a script. I, put, I use his name use his as, name. as a, an example of things that are part of society, but we don't, that, that unpleasant parts of society. Because he's screaming his name over other He screams over, names. yeah. Like if I was a famous chef, it would sort of like be a famous chef and it's like, and have Gigi Khaled come and just scream over your food. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that would be good. Oh, look what happened. We, 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 we lost, I have to go back to the thread. So Pete, do we have questions for Jay? Yeah. We're all uh, we place. do. Uh, Patrick Reese says, Pete George is my muse. Hi, Pete. Oh, that was uh, for me. I think yeah, that was for that's you, for you. <laughs> That's a little sneaky. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Pete George, here's a question for Jay. What's the best advice you can give a newbie writer? That was from before that wasn't answered. The best advice I can give a newbie writer is, I guess it's just a cliche, but write lots of stuff and then make sure it's really good. <laughs> you know, keep writing it and keep rewriting it. And then you have to step out of your writer's shoes and start being a salesman and then show it to a bunch of people and really make them read it and do it by not being a psychopath. Mm -hmm. So the way to do that is to call somebody up and say, you know, dear Jeff Lowell, Jeff Lowell's a good writer. Dear Jeff Lowell, I'm such a big fan of your work. Oh my God, you're so great. Will you do me a favor and read my script and give me notes? That's what you say. And most people aren't idiots and they know why you're giving it to them. They want you to, they want, they know you give, somebody gives me a script, they want me to say, this script is great. I have I'm a show. Right I have a show and I want you to be the star writer on my show. That's everybody wants that. Right. But often I'll read it and go like, okay, well I have notes. And I'll give them notes. Like my father gave me, I will give notes. Yeah, that's wonderful. That's... And I'll say this is what's good and this is what's not good mm -hmm. and here we are. And then when somebody writes a really great script, I am thrilled and I try to remember that person and I actually offer, I, I, I recommend mm -hmm. them to other people. Uh -huh. and that, So a great script is a good thing to have. If you have a great script, it will, should get you work. I mean, it's not easy and there's a lot of other things going on in our industry now that, that help you. Diversity helps being, um, mm -hmm. and diversity counts in, in many different ways. Mm -hmm. So that helps. So if you've got, if you're a diverse person and have a great script, oh, you're very, in very good shape. And if you're uh, not a diverse person and have a great script, you're still better off than you were if you had a shitty script. So are you going to read a script? So everybody's going to send you a script. If a friend or a friend of a friend calls you up, are you going to read a script? I do. You do? I do. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I say it's going to take me a few weeks or months right. to get to it. Mm -hmm. um, but I do try to read it. Mm -hmm. um, and and you'll give them notes. Yeah. yeah. I did Today I sat with somebody at the Coffee Bean and Tea Leaf mm -hmm. and, uh, and somebody I'm mentoring for, uh, for the Writers Guild site. There's a mentoring section of the Writers Guild mm -hmm. and I'm a mentor for it's official but I do this with people who I'm not mentoring mm -hmm. and I read her script which was very interesting and based on her life and mm -hmm. I said that, uh, that she did certain things very well and other things she needs to improve on mm -hmm. in my opinion right. and I get in my opinion well, mm -hmm. what I have to say is meaningless because mm -hmm. I'm not hiring anybody right now it doesn't really matter mm -hmm. but in my opinion you could do better on your story you could do a little more interesting on your story in mm -hmm. my opinion these characters are very well drawn and, and, and sophisticatedly told mm -hmm. in my opinion mm -hmm. That's that was that's all. all that's all I got. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you uh, when you write something funny, do you know? Do you make yourself laugh? I do. Mm -hmm. I do. I like it when I write something funny. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. I do. And I fall in love with it pretty quick. You know how you hate writing? I hate writing. I hate writing. I hate writing. <laughs> I'm sitting there writing. I got to, uh, I don't like it. And then when it starts to be funny, I'm like, oh, this is good. And then yeah. I like it more and I like it more. And, uh, or it doesn't even have to be funny. It's actually just a good story mm-hmm. beat or a good, mm-hmm. exciting moment in the script. Oh, this is delicious. How do I, be? that's fun. Mm-hmm. Those are fun moments, but they're not every moment. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of moments to get to those moments. Mm-hmm. But when I get to them, I like them. And the way I write is, and this is the other advice I give to everybody. When I'm writing, there's a voice in my head that says, this is terrible. It's the last thing you'll ever write. Mm-hmm. You'll be discovered as a fraud <laughs> in this moment from now on. So get, you know, finish your iced tea and then <laughs> find another job. That's what I hear in my head mm-hmm. all the time. So to get past that, I do other things. I say, well, I'm just gonna write five pages of the shittiest script ever written to men. And then after I get to five pages, I think, well, this is still, okay. I'm almost done. Let me get to seven pages. I'm almost done with 10 pages, I'll get to it. So I trick myself into finishing it. And then when I read it a few days later, I don't hate it. I don't hate it. I like a lot of it. Mm-hmm. Some of it I don't like, but I like a lot of it. And I can, fi- I can fix this or cut this and think, I always write too long. So cutting is easier than rewriting. Mm-hmm. And then, I have something good, but I have to fight the horrible part. The horrible part is I hate what I write. I hate it in the moment. I hate it, the voice, the critical voice in my head saying it's terrible. Mm -hmm. And that happened before my father said it was terrible. It was always that way. So don't blame dad. And it still is that way. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, after a career of 32 years, award-winning writer, 32 years. I don't know anybody who really sits and loves writing. Mm -hmm. I don't. I, I, I always say that there are two people who like it. Stephen King I was just gonna say and, and Aaron King. Sorkin mm-hmm. are the two people who love what they write. Mm-hmm. And, Stephen and, King just coming out with his 61st novel. Yeah, this week. they get like it's like you know what would be fun <laughs> sitting down and writing and going. They're having such a great time because they love their own words. I don't love myself that much, but I do afterwards, and I do rewriting. I'll appreciate myself later on, and I do like writing funny things. And I'm proud of things that are funny, and I'm proud of things that work well, and I'm proud of things that move and people. And you know when something's funny. I mean, when you make yourself laugh, you know something's funny, right? No. No, you no. don't? Here's the thing. Huh? I think I know what's funny, mm-hmm. and, and you're a stand-up, you're a comedian, you're a writer. You think you know what's funny, and then you do it, and then nobody laughs. And you're, How the fuck did that happen? <laughs> That's funny. They're wrong. Well, they're not wrong. Yeah. It wasn't funny mm-hmm. to them. Mm-hmm. Other, another audience might like it. Mm-hmm. That audience didn't like it. And I've had arguments, big arguments, about things that aren't funny that turned out to, the audience laughed very hard at. Yeah, yeah. And, I, I like, and I'm always famous about the things, one of the things, I, uh, I worked on a movie called The Nutty Professor with, with uh, Eddie. Eddie Murphy. Mm-hmm. And there's a large, at the first one there's a dream sequence where Eddie Murphy's walking like a Godzilla through a town and farts. And the fart destroys New York City, I think. And I, and I told the director, um, that's not funny. It's just gross. It's like immature. You're going to get a groan, not a laugh. Mm-hmm. Well, that's like the highlight of that movie. <laughs> that's the thing that everyone talked about is the greatest moment of that movie. Um, you know, uh, Mike, I told Mike Myers in one of the Austin Powers movies, like, he drinks a, a vial of poop in like the third gold member or whatever. He's yeah. in a lab. And there's like a vial of poop, and he's trying to, he's sampling things that, and he tastes that. I said, that is disgusting. No one's gonna laugh, and people love that too. Um, okay, so I, I know this about you. You've ghostwritten Mike Myers movies, right? Yes, you've. you've no, ghostwritten makes it sound like I wrote them. Mike Myers wrote his movies. I helped write jokes on them, yes. Yeah, I was a part of a team how, of people. How is that collaborative effort? Great. It's great. It's like being in a writer's room. It is being in a writer's okay, room. Okay, I wanted to talk to you about being in the writer's room. Because yeah. you've had, I, I assume you've had different experiences on different shows, what the writer's room is like. Like, is a writer's room always a collaborative thing? Or do you go off and write your own script and then you bring it back and everybody, how does it work? My preferred way to do things is, mm-hmm. yes, to give someone their own draft and let the writer write a draft. That I look for, write them, come up with a story. We come up with a story. Everybody likes a story? Great. You is go it, out. And is write, it the, it's not the writer who comes up with that idea no, that you not give necessarily. It to, not necessarily. That maybe that sometimes in the best of all possible worlds, somebody okay. comes in and says, "I've got the great idea for a story." That's a great idea for a story. Let's break it out. We break it out. Okay, go write that story. You brought it in. Go write it. Okay. That's the best possible scenario. Okay. But we have to come up with a lot of these twenty-two or however many years. Right. So not everybody has 
great story. So there's a lot of writers. Everybody has to get it their turn. So we come up with a story and then we give it to the next person to write. Uh -huh. And that person goes out and writes an outline. And then they come and bring it back and everybody, the whole writer's room reads the outline. They all talk about the, the story structure problems that mm -hmm. are, the outline is there for story structure. Right. What's wrong with that? How can we improve the story structure? We get notes How from- How many pages is an outline for a sitcom? Usually. It varies. I think in at Frasier it was about uh, twelve to fifteen pages. Okay. Uh, single spaced, like really. Oh, single spaced. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and and at, at Simpsons it was twenty two pages, twenty five pages. It was really a long thing, and scripts were like double that size. Mm -hmm. um, at, at 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 School of Rock or I you know six a nice six to nine page outline is a pretty strong outline. It's almost like a first draft. It's just not really all the dialogue. It's the essential pieces of the right, show. the so, elements. So you really get a good look at it and see what's wrong with it. Mm -hmm. So that's so the one writer goes and makes that, or a team. Uh -huh. They go and they, they, they bring their ver their vision. Mm -hmm. And then we get to make a notes. And then we mm -hmm. send that person or that group off to write a script. And they, again, have their time to write something great mm -hmm. and to make it great. And they have ownership of this thing. And the best of all possible world is you like most of it. You're never gonna like all of it, but at least you like most of it, or hopefully you like most of it, or or a good chunk of it. Mm -hmm. And when you're working as a group in a in a in a writer's room, mm -hmm. you those moments where you think, please save that little chunk. I love that chunk. You know that 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 came from my soul. You try to save those moments too, but you don't always get to. And the script then at the after that first draft becomes the room's draft, and usually the showrunner's draft mm -hmm. of that show. And so if, you're, if I'm working at Frasier, I'm just trying to help Chris Lloyd go home and get the jokes and moments he needs so he can go home. And that's what we're all just trying to do. So how much of that, usually, of that final script is the team that, or the person that went off and wrote it, the writer's room, or the showrunner? It because varies. from what I've been told, like at Seinfeld, everything sort of becomes Larry David's. Is that true? Or 100%. Not? At Seinfeld, 100. that's exactly what happened. Yeah. Because Larry and Jerry used to spend weekends mm -hmm. throwing away other people's drafts yeah. and rewriting it. Everything. Everything. Or, did, you know, what they were really concerned about, what Larry and Jerry, Jerry really concerned about most was the outline. Mm -hmm. Was the story funny? Mm -hmm. And they knew they could make it funny from that point on. And so people's drafts got rewritten. Now, I'm not saying that there weren't great jokes that other people wrote and they stated, but it felt like I, I was there on the weekends because I was working on a fucking single guy for no reason. And I would see Larry and Jerry there and nobody else. So I knew what they were doing. They were rewriting people's right. scripts. Um, and a lot of times showrunners rewrite people's scripts and they don't need to. They're fine. They're great the way they are. And that may have been a lot of what's going on at Seinfeld. Mm -hmm. Larry, well, Larry seems like he wanted it larified. And that's fine. Mm -hmm. He has his right. Mm -hmm. He made this great show and it should be Larry's. Mm -hmm. But if you work for Larry, know that when you turn it in, he's going to sort of make it his own. And, and so then, what was the experience on our friend Phil Rosenthal's Everybody Loves Raymond? When you wrote that script, what, what was that experience like? That was a great experience. They, We went over it and... and the room rewrote Were you it. Given, did you come in with an idea or were yes. you assigned? You came in with I an idea. I came with an idea. What was I, your idea at Raymond? Uh, Thanksgiving. It was a Thanksgiving episode, mm -hmm. and it was that uh, that the mother got glasses. I think it was the mother got glasses, and suddenly started seeing in detail things that she hated about herself, <laughs> including how old they were looking and other kind of things. <laughs> and they were like on her, like, "Mom, you can't see. Go get glasses." And then when she got glasses, it ruined their lives. <laughs> so then they had tried to find a way to get her to hide her glasses and ruin her lives. That was it. And it was a Thanksgiving episode. And I spent a good amount of time going over Thanksgiving and talking about turkey and making things. And that's the, all the stuff that Phil threw out. It was like, we don't care about Thanksgiving. We care about the glasses. That's the thing that, that, right. that you want. And uh -huh. so that's what it became a lot of. And I overwrite. I'm a, I write long. So I usually turn in a script that's 55 pages that needs to be 39 pages or, or I try to get and it and they cut it or they, no, they yeah they, they, cut, it. they cut it you don't they cut it. well I would you don't it. sweat it that you come in with 55 pages uh, and that one I figured they'll pick the best stuff that they want I'm not I didn't know exactly what the room wanted so how much time did you get to write that episode Appro approximately how much time do you get when you're assigned 
every show is different. I don't remember exactly how many. I think there was no rush. There, there on, on Raymond, they were oh. so organized. They wrote things over the summer. They were always, they were head on scripts. So mm -hmm. there was not like, we need it tomorrow. I've worked on shows where they need it tomorrow. This was not one of those shows. Mm -hmm. So I wrote it over, I, was, I think I was working on the George Lopez show at the time. Mm -hmm. So I wrote it while I was working on the George Lopez show over weekends and stuff, maybe a couple weeks. And normal, so let's say on a Frasier, how much time would you get to write a script? Couple weeks, couple weeks, two weeks, mm -hmm. two weeks maybe. Mm -hmm. Outline a week or a couple, you know, almost a week, and then two weeks to write the so script. So, like on Fraser, how much of yours would end up? I mean, any if hey, if if thirty percent of my script wound up in the show, I'd be very thrilled. Uh -huh. That'd be great. Thirty percent, that's great. I mean, I don't know. And would your jokes end up in other people's? Yeah, yeah, yeah. of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and when. Yeah, it's joke by joke. When a joke of mine wound up in somebody else's script and it went gangbusters, great. When a joke of mine wound up in somebody's script and it was died, it's like, ugh, sorry. You know, I don't know. That all happens. You yeah. know, it makes the room laugh, but it didn't make the audience laugh. How did that happen? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. So what was School of Rock like for you? Uh, fabulous. Mm -hmm. Lo loads of fun. Great. I love the music. I love making movie musicals, which I did. I got directing a bunch of those shows. I loved uh, the the actual making, I, I made music videos on that show. And that was kind of fun. It was mm -hmm. fun to work with these kids who were really talented. It was just, it was fun, big, big effects, it was fun. And so, as far as features, ver I mean, it seems like your wheelhouse is television. It, it, I like movies, I like TV, I like, Cable, I like everything. I'm writing so, a drama right now. I'm are working, you? Yes, I'm writing a drama. I'm trying to sell this other drama that I'm working on. So, you know, I'll do, I'll do, I like doing, expanding my universe. That's good. Yeah. Uh, can you talk, so drama, character driven, situationally driven? Dark drama. What would you liken it to? Can you liken it to something? Like, um, what, what do you like that's, that's like on Netflix or something? It's, it's like Fleabag. I love Fleabag. Everybody loves Fleabag. Yeah. So it's my version of Fleabag. Okay. It's not Fleabag. It's nothing right. like Fleabag, but right. tonally, mm -hmm. and it, nobody addresses the camera like right. Fleabag, but mm -hmm. tonally it's dark, like that character. It's is, funny, but it's got something to say. It's less funny. Less funny. Less funny. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, like I didn't laugh a lot at Fleabag. I laughed a little bit at Fleabag, but I mostly loved her. I loved her character, and I loved that world. So. I thought she was very funny. Yeah, I, see, I mean, her looks to the camera were, were great. Mm -hmm. I'm not doing looks to the camera. Yeah. So like, I, I could make it funny, mm -hmm. but it's a real struggle to not make it funny. I want to make it ironic and weird, but, but good. I don't know what else to, to compare it to. I mean, it's like, it's like uh, Dear White People a little bit. It's like um, Fleabag a little bit. It's like, uh, um, it's like, uh, uh, What's the one with Christina Applegate that just came out to, about the, the husband's dead and uh, it was great. Um, I didn't see it. Uh, it's fabulous. The audience knows this. Oh, Christina Applegate, it's a Netflix show and it's my I friend Liz makes show. it. Good. Oh my God, it's so good. Oh, I'm so glad to hear this. I love Christina Applegate too. What is so, the Christina Applegate uh, somebody show tell audience? Us. I don't know. Um, anyway, anyway it's, uh, it's not what I lie to you. It's you're dead to me. That's what it is. You're dead to me. It's called You're Dead to Me. Did I see what I Anyway, made? it's I great. Wait a minute, maybe I did see Dead that. to Me. Oh shit, I did see that. I, okay. I did like it. Okay, well there you go. Yeah, it was great. It was great. Yeah, it was great. So it's a little bit like that. Yeah, that was great. Okay, so there's a lot of dramatic twists and stuff. And, you know what? It wasn't great for me. It was good for me. Okay. I, I liked it. Well, my show will be good for you. Uh, yeah. Not great. I, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I, I liked that show. I, mm -hmm. I just remembered it. It's all okay. coming back to me with the car. Yes. Yeah, it's coming back to okay. me. I, I liked it. Okay. I, it wasn't a flea bag for me. No, but, it's not like flea bag, but yeah. I'm, you're asking me shows to compare it to. Right, right. Okay, okay. I, I So... You need more salsa. This is so, not enough salsa. So, well, if you would have been look at all these chips. If you would have been look at all these chips and this oh, much yes, salsa. Yeah. There's an equilibrium problem here. Well, I when I watched your show, when Dan was on, I was mad he didn't eat the rolls. I know you told. I was him like, to and eat then he started eating fruit, and I was like, you fucking asshole, eat the rolls. But <laughs> and then he did. Cause he's skinny, and I'm not, so I'm not gonna eat the rolls. So, are you a foodie? Yes. What? So, what? What do you love? What do you love in L.A.? Favorite restaurants? Serious. Din Tai Fung in my. Do you have you been to Din Tai Fung? Yeah, of course. Fung? I love Din Tai Fung. It's near my house. Um, uh, I went, ate at a great restaurant recently called Republic. Mm -hmm. Oh, Phil. That's Phil's like. 
It's fabulous. Yeah, he's I, part in there. He, I, he owns every restaurant, so yes, you can't just does. say he's, it's Phil's. He's got, he's got his but that, that particular one. one I went to without did, knowing it was Phil's. What did you eat? And I still liked it. Yeah. We ate everything. We ate uh, uh, strange lamb, and we ate beautiful mm-hmm. steaks, and we ate uh, 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 sushi, and we ate, it was every bite of everything was fabulous. Nice. Yeah. Favorite, yes. Yeah. Favorite Chinese restaurant in LA? Do you have one? Um, it used to be Ah Fong's in the Valley, but now it is uh, Twin Dragon, probably. Where's that? On Robertson near Pico. Okay, I need this recommendation because yeah. I it's Chinese like, food in LA just doesn't. It's work New York-y. Me. It's okay. not as yeah. You're gonna be disappointed. Yeah. It's New York-y. It's New York-y. But I love it. We like it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Favorite Italian? Um, there's lots, so many good ones. Dantana's, Toscana. Um, gosh, I mean, I don't try not to eat, but you know, uh, uh, yeah. Matteo's we eat at sometimes because Frank about- Sinatra ate there. Anywhere Frank Sinatra ate, we'll eat Italian food. <laughs> What about favorite deli? Because that's a very New York thing. What's your favorite deli? Favorite deli? Well, Langer's for the pastrami. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think... How's Brent's? Because I've never been, but I hear about it. I don't know about Brent's. Do you like Brent's? How do you not go... How do you live in Los Angeles? I have never been to Brent's. You're closer to Brent's than you are to any other deli in the world. I go to Langer's. Okay, Brent's is fabulous. Is it? Brent's is fabulous. It's great. Their bread is fabulous. There are... Because Langer's has the best rye bread, like, ever. This par baked just like Brent's. Okay. Um, Good and, to know. and so, but they, they don't want to hear about delis. Well, no, yeah, because we have a lot of people. Fad, the, all the they, delis are fine. The uh, Katz's Deli is great in New York. The Second Avenue, the the um, uh, the, the Nate Nails. We we enjoy Nate Nails Deli. It's near our house. We like um, uh, we can eat at Factors Deli. We like Arts Deli. We like you oh, know. Oh, you're you're not too discriminating then. You're well, it depends on what it is. Okay. It depends That's on what true. we want. The meats at certain places, the soups at certain places, the chopped liver at certain places. Mm, this is true. So what are you going to do? So so you're writing now for a Netflix kind of thing? I'm writing a bunch of shit. I really am about writing a bunch of shit. I didn't, I'm not on a show right now. I'm only about making pilots and trying to sell pilots and trying to do stuff. What's so. the best of all worlds for you? The best of all worlds is me Indeed. working on a TV show. Well, me I working think- on a, or a movie that's being made. I like production. I like working with people. You know how much I hate writing? Mm-hmm. I love making. I love letting actors act. I like being part of that process. I like making things funny, making sure the shots are good, making sure the editing works. Producing sure. is a good thing. You like producing? I like directing. I like producing. And, and that's all part of being a writer. Mm-hmm. Like being a writer, you have to know what it's supposed to look like and the, the timing of things and the look of things. And you have a vision in your head and be open to other people's visions, but still walk in with at least with an idea of what mm-hmm. it's supposed to look like. Do you have an open mind to other people's ideas? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I love it. I like the col- I like the collaboration. Mm-hmm. The collaboration's good. Mm-hmm. And when an actor says, can I do it this way? I always say, yes, please. Thank you. What's the harm? Of course. I like it. Yeah, me too. Yeah. And we get great stuff from that people. And when you're working with uh, uh, younger actors, they really learn a lot. When I'm directing a show, I always have my actors do it, do an improvised version of a scene. So every, not every scene, but a scene. I mm-hmm. say, you're all robots. Pretend you're robots, do the same scene. Do the same lines, but you're all robots. And interact differently, different blocking, but you're robots, do the scene. And they all do it and they learn something about the scene. Mm-hmm. They learn something, different meanings of the words and different meanings of the dialogue. And also it loosens them up and lets them have some fun and play. Especially when you're working with kids. I feel bad that kids are working. That's for shit. So, mm-hmm. at least they can play. I How want old are the kids play. on School of Rock? They range from 13 to 17 or mm-hmm. something like that. And But they loved it. Most of them loved it. Mm-hmm. I think one or two of them may not have loved it. Mm-hmm. Loved it. They liked it. Fine, but they have loved it. I don't know. But um, I wanted them to have fun. I kept saying, are they having fun at home? Are they going out? You know, are they riding bicycles and doing stuff? And most of them were. I don't know. Is there anything I know? I know you're working on a lot of stuff right now, but is there is there a bigger dream? Is there like a biggest dream? Is there my biggest dream is that my son becomes very very successful. Mm-hmm. That's my big dream. Mm-hmm. So they're all gonna listen. Everybody out there is gonna buy <laughs> Charlie Cogan's album, Songs from the Front Seat, and listen to them and complain to me at <laughs> jcogan at aol.com <laughs> if they don't love it. But um, yeah, I mean, my dream is to, is to have a show that's great, that I'm proud of, that, that people get to see. That's it. I'd love it to be successful, but that's not important as much as it's good, mm-hmm. and people get to see it, and we get to make it. Mm-hmm. 
I'd like to make the show. Uh, it's, I spend a lot of time writing things that don't get made, mm -hmm. and that's frustrating. Mm -hmm. I, I get to make more than most, but I still, that's my favorite part, is getting stuff made. And at the end of the day, being happy with how it is, being proud of it. Most of the time, I'm proud of it. Has there been anything that you've done that you were like, oh, I don't like the way that came out? Yes. Yes? Ugh, yes. Yes. I'm very critical of all the stuff I've done, and, and then moments in everything I've done, just ugh. <laughs> but we didn't have anything better in that moment, mm -hmm. and we needed that to tell the story. Like, I can watch Simpsons episodes now, and I see mistakes to this day, as all I see is the mistakes. Wow. The second I stop working there, I watch the show and say, oh, this is great, top to bottom. There are no mistakes, it's great, because I, I wasn't there for all the criticisms and, pro and solutions. So I still see the mistakes, but I'm proud of those shows. I'm proud of, I'm proud of Wendell and Vinny, a show that I made. I'm proud of the, the, the Simpsons, I'm proud of Frasier, I'm proud of the, the, the shows that, that, uh, that other people liked very much, like, like uh, uh, you know, George Lopez or Wanda Sykes. I'm proud of Malcolm in the Middle, which people like very much. I'm proud yes. of all these things. And, and when I say proud, I'm not, those aren't, it's a group that made right, it. I'm right, proud right. to be part of that group. Right. I'm not proud to say, ah, it's me, even shows I've created. It's a group thing. Have you ever worked in partnership again since that? that other I work quality? all the time in partnerships. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as a matter of fact, from School of Rock, mm -hmm. I was partnered really with Steve and Jim Armagita, who created the show. We became partners in that show. Mm -hmm. Truly partners. Mm -hmm. It was great. Love those guys. Would work them in a heartbeat. We felt confident. I'll do this, you do that. And I knew it would be great. We'd, we'd, we'd agree with each other. The end result would work out. And if we had little squabbles, somebody said, well, I don't like that joke. We would change. You know, nobody's holding on to anything mm -hmm. for dear life. That's how partnership should work. Do you, do you not hold your babies precious? Are you able to... Uh... How precious can they be? If, some, if two people are saying, eh, <laughs> it's not good, then how much... You, you can only you fight so fight much. You something that you love. Do you yeah. fight I fight the network. Love? I fight the network. I think if I'm running a show, I get at least one or two moments that everyone else hates that I love. I put those in. I make them. At least I film them. I don't always put them in at the end. If the audience really, really boos, hates it, then it might not go in. But there are things I think are funny that should be funny, that should work. And when they don't, it's very frustrating. So I allow myself one or two of those moments, but that's it. Wow. Um, and, and no, I, I try not to fight too hard for something because jokes are easy. Jokes come easy. Place one joke with another joke and it doesn't matter. Stories are hard. Mm -hmm. Characters are second hardest, but stories are the hardest. And don't fight for the jokes. Fight for the moments. I fight for the moments in the story that are important. Fight for the beats in the story that make sense. Fight for the relevance of a story. If you change a story to, from one thing to another, sometimes it completely loses meaning for me. And I say, well, why are we doing it? Why are we making, what's the point of this episode if we don't have the husband and wife fight at the end? They're not fighting about this stupid little thing. The whole point was about how husband and wives fight. Let me see how they fight. And then if they take that away, then I, I tell the network, I will fight with the network. I said, well, what is this about then? And they have to prove to me it's about something, otherwise. Can you win those arguments? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Especially when I submitted outline after outline for their approval saying, this is a paragraph. This is what the show is about. It's about a husband and wife having a little argument that goes bigger and bigger until they finally have World War III. Mm -hmm. That's the story. Mm -hmm. They've approved that. Mm -hmm. I said, what happened to that? Let's get back to, give me notes that get me back to that. That's fair. Mm -hmm. That's fair. Mm -hmm. And if you don't like that story, tell me no right, right away. Say, we don't like World War III. Great, I'll give you another story. But kill it early. Don't make me go all the way to script. Don't make me go just before show and then say, it's not working. Mm -hmm. Because that's not fair. Mm -hmm. The story is working. Pieces of it may not be working. We can fix those. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, that's what uh, I would fight for. No, I like that. Other uh, questions? Yes. Yeah, uh, let me see. Mike Rowe said, tell Jay to do any one of his many impressions. Mike Rowe? Yeah. Yeah. Hi, oh, Mike. okay. Well, then I, have, I have Mike Rowe impression. Okay. I'm Mike Rowe. I'm a comedy writer. I have kids. It's pretty good. It's pretty, was, it's almost. I was really, I don't know him. No, I'm it's really exactly good. like Mike Rowe. It's identical. Give, okay, so give, give something that everyone will know who it is. Do an impression of something that everyone will know. I don't. You don't do I don't, impressions. I'm not famous for doing okay. impressions. Okay. I can do, uh, uh, I can do my, my Hank Azaria doing Al Pacino impression. Okay, that's good. This is, uh, Hank, Hank tells a story that he worked with Michael Mann uh, on a set, on a show called Heat. Mm -hmm. And the, Michael Mann's telling Al Pacino 
And again, this is Hank Azaria's impression. Me right. doing his, uh, he's saying, okay, Al, you're going to walk over there and you're going to talk to this other guy and he's going to jackpot you. And you're going you're gonna to be afraid you're going to get jackpotted. So you turn around and you tell him, yay, nobody jackpots me. And then Al Pacino says, what? What is jackpot? What are you talking about? <laughs> jackpot. I don't, I don't understand jackpot. Um, and uh, it, it goes on from there. They just argue back and forth about what jackpot means. I like it. Great. Okay. Great. Uh, let's see. Patrick Reese says, how do you submit a screenplay to production companies when you are just out of the gate? Submit a screenplay to production companies? Don't do that. Mm. Uh, you s submit a screenplay to a producer. You want to get somebody who can buy it. So... What you want to do is get somebody who can buy it to read it. So you want to get a producer to read it. So you look up on IMDb who some of your favorite producers are and you find out where they hang out and if they have a Facebook place or whatever. And then you sort of write them a friendly email. And you don't write an email saying, I got a screenplay. You write an email saying, I love your work. You're a genius. Just, just letting you know that there you have fans out there. And if they're like, 99% of people, they go, oh, I'm a genius. Let me write this person back and see why they think I'm a genius. And then you start strike up a relationship with that person. And then you slowly but surely talk about the difficulties of the industry and, well, your hopes and dreams. And, but all the while telling how great this producer is. And then eventually you slip it in that you want this person. I would love your notes. I would love your, to see what you think of my screenplay. Just to read it, just to see if you think I've got the, the right stuff. And then hopefully they'll read it. Lots of people will read it, or they'll give it to their person to read mm -hmm. for coverage. Mm -hmm. uh, and eventually you'll get in the cycle. But I don't know, like if you send a script to Paramount or you send a script to, uh, uh, you know, Annapura, nobody's going to read it. They're not legally. They're bound to send it back to you because of that. If they have a script that's like it, you'll sue them. Mm -hmm. They'll get sued anyway. But <laughs> it's still, you need you need to convince somebody to read your script. And the producer's the person to go to. Producer, if Reese Witherspoon's going to read your script, that's a great person too. That's a great so, person. Or if a director is going to read your script, that's a great person too. So mm -hmm. if any of the people if you uh, that are, are if, if Jennifer Lawrence or uh, Martin Scorsese <laughs> or Lawrence Bender wants to read your script, send it, let them read it. Let yeah, them read it. That'd be good Don't be afraid anybody's going to steal it either. Just let them read it. So you're really, you're, you're Worker. You're smart that way. I mean, you know how to work the business. I know that I want people to buy. I want, the end result is I want my script to be bought. And I want, or I want to be exposed to people that can hire me. Okay, this is really important because what this show is really about is how people who are successful merge creativity and commerce. Because people like me who do the creative part, not so much with the commerce part. Mm -hmm. And that's the part that's missing. But you always have, have had that drive. I have that drive. I don't always have success, but I have that drive. Yeah, but it's always been a com an important component for you is I want to be paid for this. I want to be hired for this. I want to make <laughs> yeah. money. Yeah. yeah no, because that's never the thing that drives me. My, my mother's going crazy right now, but that's not the thing that drives me. But I I, I, would, I, I would do it for free if, it, if something was great. I've worked for nothing. I don't just do it for money. I would do it for, I work for free all the time for things yeah. I, I love and things that would be great. But best of all possible worlds? Get paid. Get paid, and right, get paid and get paid. Well. Yeah, exactly. Yes, I love so, that. But yes, I would like to sell it. And, and TV, there's a certain way to sell things. With movies, it's much harder these days. There's another the way to sell it. The business of show, did you learn? Did, was, it, is that instinctual for you or did you learn? I learned over time. Like, mm -hmm. like who, who, who's important? Who's important? I didn't know who's important until I started trying to sell things. And then I figured I was getting calls back from certain kinds of people and other great reaction from some people, but they couldn't buy anything. They would like for certain producers I was selling to said, this is great. Let's go try to sell it. I went, no, I sent it to you to try and sell it. So yeah, well, I don't have a deal. I have no money. It's like, ah, I should sell it to somebody who has a deal at a studio so they can bring it to a studio and make them buy it. That's a good idea. So people who have deals at studios, people who have big movies at studios, people who are being sought after by studios, that's a good person to partner with. That adds so value. So you start though by with a relationship. You don't you don't jump in with I've got something for you to Oh, well it's just very hard uh, to get on people's radar. There's that people have a lot of scripts. I have a ton of scripts to read. I've agreed to read people's scripts uh, uh, too many scripts and I can't get to them all and it's going to be hard to even get to any. So 
No, it's not, it's not a successful way. And, and I don't have a show to offer anybody. Mm -hmm. So those people are waiting on me, hoping that I'm going to help them. And for the most part, I'm not going to help them because I don't have a show to offer them. And I only have advice to give right. them. And that's but only that goes, be very helpful. Only goes so far. Mm -hmm. It's not really the end game. The end game yeah. is get, get me job. to a job yeah. that yeah, yeah. pays me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the end game. Uh, more questions, Pete? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, why? This is Trish Ann. Why don't TV shows have music anymore in the openings? Trisha Ann. Um, I'm gonna, they don't? No, they don't. Really? The reason is... There's something in there. This is chocolate. The reason they don't have... Uh, lo the reason they don't have music is they don't want to spend the time having an opening that, that sets up the show because they want to sell that time to commercials. They want to spend... They want to sell that time to advertisers. So they keep asking shows to have less and less of an opening credit. Is that true? It's true. And that's why... I haven't noticed that there isn't music before shows. Well, there is on The Big Bang Theory and there is yeah. on Chuck Lorre shows because he yeah. tells the network to fuck off. But but many other shows... Like name a show that doesn't have music at the beginning. Does The Good Place have an opening? Probably not. It just says The Good Place. Mm -hmm. you know, no. You know, something like that. Or uh, um, uh, I'm, trying, I'm trying to think of other shows that are, are not Chuck Lorre shows. I mean, does, does uh, Modern Family has a big opening. Does... You know the, the new batch, new crop of shows. Single parents. I don't. Know, I bet like that happens. Shows on Netflix have music. Sometimes, a lot of the time they do. But Phil's I mean, show has music. He has. He, yeah. Yeah, I know his shows on YouTube. I mean, like which well, show? Well, no, his show. Ever that's on, on, No, somebody feed Phil on Netflix. Yes, it's on Netflix. Yeah, yeah. but I mean, yeah. it's like you can do that. On, Netflix has no time limit. They're not selling commercial right. time. Right. Right. That's fine. We're talking about a network so show. So network that are, shows no longer will have. They, they try, they not, try to not to because they want to have that time for if if I have a thirty second opening and a show that's only can be twenty you know nineteen minutes long, mm -hmm. thirty seconds is a long time to devote to an opening number. Yeah, it's really hard to tell a story at eighteen minutes that has an interesting beginning, middle, and end. So they say, well, let's make the opening really short and spend more time with the show. That's what happens. Interesting. But I think those opening numbers really set the show and give people an environment to work to put their brain in. I think they're really helpful. Yeah. And they, they don't they don't let people do that anymore. That works. They don't want the, they don't want it to be done. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Interesting, yeah. Uh Trisha Ann, uh let's see, will Jay shout out a line I can improv on? What? She wants me to shout out a line she can improv on. Um where is she gonna improv it? She's gonna in her comment back. Okay. In her comment back. All right. Okay. Uh, yes. Trisha Ann <laughs> Um, <laughs> this is a first. Yeah. <laughs> this is hysterical. Trisha Ann, put down the gun. <laughs> That's one. my line. There I you like go. it. Okay, Trisha Ann, you're, you're, you're uh, Dan Pasternak. Hello. Hi, oh, Dan Pasternak. Bill Font. Hi, Bill. Hi, Bill Font. I spoke to him earlier today. Did you? I did. I know Bill. I know Bill. Everybody knows Bill. Everybody knows Bill. Um, you got more? I do. Okay. Yeah. What was your favorite uh, Simpsons character to write for? And That's Julie Warner. Julie Warner. Julie. I love you. And my favorite Simpsons character to write for was, of course, Homer. Because he's retarded. Are we allowed to say retarded? <laughs> yeah, he was learning well. disabled. Yeah. Um, he was, uh, he, he's so dumb that he's funny. Mm -hmm. It was just so, it's so, it's, it's so fun to write for somebody that dumb. Mm -hmm. And still make him seem like he can walk in the, amongst this earth without, you know, getting murdered at any particular moment. It's a pleasure. Mm -hmm. So that's my favorite Simpson character. Right. There's an acknowledgement from Patrick. Patrick Reese. Seriously, would like to thank you for being uh, encouraging to us newbies. Thank you so much. You too, Vicki. Uh, thank you for being so encouraging. Patrick Reese did not get my letter saying he should get out of the business. And I feel really bad <laughs> now that this came up. So Actually, sorry. He posted the letter. He did? Okay. So Patrick, I'm sorry for what I wrote earlier. Josh Schreiber. Hi, Josh. Josh Schreiber? Yeah. Okay. You know Josh? Was the, the son yeah, of, yeah. of, yes, I do yeah, know Josh yeah. Schreiber. We called him Shrive in the old days. Oh, there you go. Yes. Yes, he was, a, it was a, a, a singer in a band I watched called Double D Nose. I have heard Josh sing. Yes, he was great. Mm -hmm. And now we're, we're in contact now on the, on the Facebook. On the, fa the yeah. Facebook is a wonderful thing, yes. too. And you call, Josh it, changed, I call it the Facebook. Too. I only call it the Facebook oh, because you call it the Facebook. I do, I do. Because, but uh, Josh, uh, you know, helps people with their lives now. He does. I know. We, it's amazing. We know each other from that helping sort of world. That's great. Yeah. 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 I'm proud of him. He's amazing. Yes. 
Yeah. Trish is not uh, responding yet. Trish, Trish is not doing her improv. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it takes her long to The gun me. is still being aimed at me. So, so Pete, do the you have uh, any shows you want to promote? What do you... you you want to you want to talk? Do you want to come out and I'm say hello to people? Here. Come over here I'm and say here. he's going to come. Yeah. And I'm, I'll go behind Same the camera. <laughs> Look at that! We right. haven't had this happen before. We haven't had this happen. No uh, one's ever done me? that before. By the way, thank you. This is a really really Just great interview. I'm enjoying it. You got it? Am I? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Seventy seven social club. Social this is, this club. Is, this is Pete George, everybody. For those of you who don't know. I was over there before. He was there. Now I'm over here. So what are you doing? A uh, special event this at the 77 Social Club in San Francisco on the 14th, and then I'm off to uh, I'm doing a one night stand um, in uh, in Detroit. It's actually called One Night Stands. The name of the club is Stan. That's the owner. So it's a play one night on words. Stand. One night stands. Oh, okay. But you're not doing one night. No, I'm doing five shows. Yeah, three you're miss women right, so I I can't even go there. She's mad you. at me. Can you I, believe that? I'm actually making money performing, <laughs> doing what I do, and she's mad. Know about that. I'm gonna bring back soup though. Okay, as long as you bring back soup. Uh, yeah, this is uh, Jay. This is great. Great interview too. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. Tell Josh. Josh Schreiber said, "Whatever happened to that Bart Simpson rap we gave you? He gave me a rap." All right, wait. Okay. Now, now you're right. switching. Okay. Okay. No, you stay there. Bye, Pete. Thank you. you. Stay there. Okay. Sorry. No. Now, well, then now the frame's too high, so I'll just no. stand like this. Oh, no. <laughs> so anyway, oh, no, you change the frame. Okay, yeah. no, it's good. Yeah. Okay. Um, Vicky's not in. Uh, yeah, she's doing <laughs> cut off. Just like no boobs. It's just your head. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, come on, that's you know. I know that's there's the money. That, that, that's the money shot. Uh, the girls. So Josh wrote wrote a. I played the song to my bosses at the Simpsons, and yeah. they didn't want to use it. Oh, so that's what happened to it. Josh. They didn't. They they didn't want to use it. Not because it wasn't great, but because they didn't understand. They were older. Jim Brooks, you know, they were older guys. Sam Simon were older guys. They didn't get the rap, and they wrote a different rap that you probably heard that you realized was not that good. So yours was Oh, bad. really? Is that true? Yeah, Bart Simpson had a couple rap songs, and they were not great. So sorry, Josh. Sorry, Josh. Um, uh, I said you we sampled Hendrix, Hendrix and Alex Cooper. Oh. Yep. Uh, and the uh, Trisha also wrote that she she had an answer to the gun. She oh, was yeah? saying, "Put down the gun." She says, "Because I, I was taking the I forgot exactly what it was, but you, uh, I said, uh, Trisha, put down the gun." She says, "I won't, because you're eating the last donut." She added information. Wow. So that's good that's, work, Trisha. That's, that's good improv work. That's good I, improv. I know that. Yes. Well, um, it, uh, I think we have we gone through the questions, Pete? We have. Well, Jay, thank you so much for doing this. I, I know that you had a schlep across town and you had to sit around, but this is very helpful stuff. I, I have that, one question for you. Okay. You live. I don't know, 40 feet from a street called Ocean View. I do. That's nowhere near the fucking ocean. All right, you ready for So this? what's that about? I'm going to tell you the answer Okay. To this. Because when we first moved here, yeah. we actually looked at a house up the hill uh -huh. on Ocean View right. that we were going to we were gonna buy, and we stood on the deck, and you could see the fucking ocean. All right. And we are so far from the ocean that it is crazy. What percentage of Ocean View sees the ocean? One like percent? One house. Yeah, I think that's not right. I think that's, you can't call a street Ocean View for one... <laughs> One house. Is, yeah, I mean, one terrace yeah. on one house. It's called. And it's, it's, and it snows up here. It, I believe that. Yeah, yeah. Of course it does. But but yeah, there's one house that has an ocean view. Right. And That's so like, therefore, the whole street is yeah, ocean view. Like parrot land, and there's one parrot. You don't. Know, you can't name it parrot land. <laughs> well, they get away with murder. Right. What can I tell you? Right. The, per, the person who named the street obviously lived in that house. No, it obviously was it a realtor saying. We'll get people to buy houses on Ocean View because they'll think there's a fucking ocean. I'll tell you though, it's crazy that to be this far away and to have been able, there are there are a bunch of houses up there actually that can see the ocean, right. which is really strange. Yeah. But it must be just because we're so high up. This you is, can see it from here when it's clear. I've seen yeah. it because I used to live here. There have been moments in my life when I, it yeah. looked kind of like yeah. my penis was really big, well, but saying. it's not really big. So if I call myself Big Penis J, yeah. I think people would be really upset. I was on Ocean View one time and saw your penis. Exactly. <laughs> I thought it was a parrot. <laughs> oh, no. Anyway, thank you so much for doing thanks this. Thanks for inviting me. It, and it thanks my, for all this junk food. It, it was my pleasure. And, <laughs> and, and you know, I know this just seems like we were sitting around shooting the shit, but this is very helpful stuff. It really, Even to me. I, I have gleaned things that I am going to... Uh, Do nothing with. No, I am. No. I am. I, I, I am. Right. Okay, I am. good. All right. I, I, I like the five pages today because everybody's got their own thing. Mm -hmm. Yes. My friend Chris Broncato does Narcos and he has a I know, you, you Chris, know Chris. I know Chris okay. Broncato. So Chris's 
at writing thing yeah. is that he he sets a timer yes. for 10 minutes. Right. And let's say he's working on five projects. Right. He sets a timer 10 minutes and he stops when he hits the 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And then he goes back at the end to the thing that is most pressing. And that's the thing he'll work on that day. But he does 10 minutes on every project every day. That's, okay, what he that's does. ridiculous. That's 10 minutes would get me nowhere. It's I would, crazy. I would, I, would, I would start sipping iced tea and it would go <laughs> ding and be over. But but he's pretty successful. He's very successful. I know, and it works for him. All right, well, good but for you. That's what good he for does. you, Chris but, Brancato. But, but I like I like the five page like because I I you feel good at the end of the day at the very least if you are writing a, a movie script and it's 120 pages mm -hmm. you know in 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 very short time you will have in 24 days you will have a full 120 pages. Okay, so let me ask you this: I'm now revising a script that is 199 pages that I have to make 100 pages mm -hmm. in comedy. Right. How much revision work will you do in a day and feel like, okay, I've accomplished? Revision work to me is more like, it's, it's a lot easier because you're not starting from the blank page. Yes. So, you gotta do go a through pages. it. Go through the whole go thing. Go through the whole in fucking... In one day? No, act by act. Okay. Go through act one. Okay. Go through act two. Go through act three. Just go through it. and Or, or mark it like suddenly, oh, I'm changing this. i got to remember to change that other thing now. Now that I've killed the cat in act one, I should take the cat out I of act two. I can never read a page and not make changes. I, I never... That's why it took me a gazillion years to write my book. Okay, well, I mean, you've got to... Can you do that? Can you... Do you keep moving forward without... Yeah. Yeah, you it's do. It's my pleasure to move you, forward. you got to keep moving yeah, forward. Yeah, I mean, i got to get through it. i got to give it to somebody. i got to let other people look at it after I've looked at it enough times. But I do want to revise it. I want to make it better and better and better. Usually it's by cutting. At it's, what At what point, yes. At what point are you giving something to somebody to somebody else? When I think it's good. When I think it's it's actually good. And I've, usually I give it to like a writer's assistant kind of person. Mm -hmm. And I... I ask that person, you know, is it spelled right and all that? But also, what are the big glaring holes? Mm -hmm. And that person will tell me, oh, you know, you've you killed somebody off that you never introduced. And you go, oh, shit, mm -hmm. i got to go back and get that thing. So a lot of glaring errors will be fixed in that process. And then... Uh, um, You're gonna give, before you give it to somebody you love and respect and want the love Well, back the right assistant is somebody I respect too, but yeah. that they know what they're getting, mm -hmm. the, how rough it's going to be. And then my friends are getting something they, they know. Sometimes it's in rough shape, and I'll say, this is in rough shape. Or I say, I think it's pretty close. Tell me what you think, you know. And I, get, I do it for other people all the time. And do you, get, do, you t do you get, you obviously take that stuff to heart and address it. Yeah. yeah, and especially if more than one person mm -hmm. says it, multiple people are saying this doesn't make sense to me. Then he's like, well, "Holy shit, that's a real, that's a big problem." But if something, but if it's something you love, here's the thing: somebody tells you the joke on page five doesn't work for me. Mm -hmm. If you love the joke on page five, you're not going to change it. But if you've always thought the joke on page five is just okay, somebody doesn't say they love it, they say it's kind of weak, then you go, "Yeah, it's kind of weak." Mm -hmm. So usually it's confirming things you kind of already know, yeah. and you're saying that's an easy thing to change. If somebody loves, if you love your uh, DJ Khaled joke, <laughs> and you're not going to get rid of it because you think it's really smart. Um, Did you get rid of it? No. <laughs> no, because I, I, well, it wasn't that it was really smart. It was just the right reference yes. for when I wrote it, which was six months ago. It's probably not the right, right. reference anymore. Mm -hmm. But at the time, it was the right reference. Um, so I don't know. But, you know, being a, a guy in his mid-50s, I have to sort of figure out what a guy in his 20s would be talking about or liking or things like that. And there's very few... The Venn the yeah. then diagram of what we both would like is very small. Very small. small. But I try to yeah. keep up and, and know what my son is liking and what, he, what he's listening to and what his friends are listening to. And so I, I use that. Excellent. Yeah. Um, Pete, thank Goodbye. you so much Thanks, for, Pete. for doing this. Yeah. And, uh, and Jay, thank you so much for making the trip Remember, and for doing this. Charlie Kogan, Charlie songs Kogan. from the front seat. You download it or, or favor it, like it, and, and put it on your playlist. Or else you write to Jay Kogan at AOL.com. No, you have to listen to it. And if you don't like it, then we'll talk about it. Okay. Thank you okay. so much. You're welcome. I appreciate okay. it. Okay. Oh, you're going to hug me. I'm going to okay. give you a hug right. and a kiss. We'll see you next week. I can't remember who's on the show. Whatever. Oh, oh my God. Oh my God. Cameron Crowe? Mike Finnegan. Okay, wait. This is crazy. Okay. Mike Finnegan played keyboards on Electric Ladyland on Still Raining, Still Dreaming with Hendrix. I mean, I I worship Mike Finnegan. He's an unbelievable keyboard player. His son plays. Mm -hmm. Mike Finnegan is.
phenomenal. Cool. And um, he's going to be on the show, and I'm very excited. You should have um, Jimi Hendrix on. He's very I, good, too. Mm-hmm. Anyway, um, thank you all for joining us, and we'll see you next week on Game Changers with me.